should probably do that. <laughs> okay. So, I wanted to cover some of this stuff on Friday when it came out, but I was playing with uh, It Takes Two. So, yeah, we're uh, going to be covering the, um, uh, the death of Shinzo Abe, as well as... We're going to be talking about the Roger outages that had happened and left a lot of Canadians out of, like, not just cell services and internet services, but even things like uh, the ATM and stuff. So we'll be going over that, as well as uh, Whistleblower has come forward about... Um, Patrick Brown's campaign and was talking uh, about like some sort of like third party uh, stuff going on with that with Patrick Brown like honestly I don't really think it's going to matter too much with him so it won't really matter too much um and then we'll probably be talking about some of the uh, other stuff uh, about Shinzo Abe. Because, like, I honestly didn't really like him too much. And nor do my uh, Japanese friends either. So we can get into that why. Or we can get... Uh, why later so <sighs> so yeah we'll be going over some of that and yeah we'll have a little bit of fun with that so we'll jump into We'll jump into it now, I guess. So we'll start off with uh, Shinzo, Shinzo Abe's death, because, you know, assassinated on Friday. Wanted to talk about that on Friday, because, you know, that's pretty important, I would say. So, yeah, we'll start off with that. Lots of details are pouring in. Akshay Tandon is standing by with the very latest. Akshay, um, the alleged shooter, admitting to what he did. Meantime, there is a lot of shock, grief, and anger out there this morning. Good morning, Marcia. Indeed, there is a lot of shock, grief, anger this morning at this horrific news coming out of Japan. The longest-serving leader died after he was shot from behind as he addressed members of the public in the western city of Nara. Now, here is a look at how it all unfolded and a warning to our viewers. The scenes are disturbing. I should probably double-check to see. Stuff in here. So let's let's do that. <laughs> Bro. Like, I haven't seen, like, any of the footage yet, so it's kind of wild to me, but it's, I, I just, I, I just don't know what to do about that, man. It's not okay. Chaotic scenes right after that shooting, Marcia, and the shooter opened fire on Abe. Japanese media reporting that the weapon appeared to be homemade gun. Police said that a 41-year-old man, as you can see in these pictures over there, suspected of carrying out the shooting. I'm not, I'm not going to show any, uh, any of that stuff because, you know, it's TOS. Has now been arrested, identified as Tetsuya Yamagami, as police telling us he was 
dissatisfied with Abe and wanted to kill him. Now, okay, so <clears throat> uh, some background on Shinzo Abe, uh, first and foremost. Uh, Shinzo Abe was a uh, <clears throat> personally I didn't like him nor did a lot of my Japanese friends <clears throat> uh, all of his <clears throat> his grandfather and his father were involved in politics as well and so was he <clears throat> he uh He was under the Liberal Democratic Party, which was set up as a uh, a counterparty to the rising communist motions in Japan after World War II, as well as <clears throat> uh, yeah, he just fucking sucked overall. Like a lot of, from what I understand. From uh, my Japanese friends, he uh, was not very liked in at least in at least in their circles. Uh, overall, I think he didn't really do it. He had a very big nationalist attitude as well, so that's uh, it's not pretty cool because like. When it came down to, like, say, like, the fucking Japanese, uh, decline in, uh, you know, births and shit like that, he had, um, he had a, he did have a play in that, so, what he ended up doing was, like, promoting, like, campaigns and, like, <clears throat> you know, having, having kids and shit, and, like, Free concert, uh, free contraceptives, or some shit like that. I don't exactly remember. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't too great, to be completely honest. As well as his uh, f policy when it came to immigration was also very, very fucking bad. So, I won't even bother getting onto that because, like, you know, when a population uh, decline happens in a country, you know, <clears throat> immigration is one of the biggest ways to, to fight against that. But Japan, like, like, since I have a decent knowledge of Japan and, like, how a lot of their structures and everything work, I can't really say that I'm surprised by, by it, so, he, uh, yeah. They, they're very isolationist. They're very nationalistic. It's not to say like I don't like Japan. I do like Japan uh, quite a lot because you know I have my friends there. I want to want to visit there. You know. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's definitely an interesting. Interesting situation. Uh, from what I understand, the weapon that was used to kill Abe was made out of duct tape and PCV pipe. Uh, the first shot missed, according to reports, and the the second shot got him. So, yeah, it's it's, it's crazy. Shinzo Abe bled to death from deep wounds to the heart and the right side of his neck despite receiving more than 100 units of blood transfusions over four hours at the hospital. The assassination of Japan's former prime minister has stunned world leaders, meanwhile, lots of reactions coming in and widespread criticism and condemnation as well. Let's start with Prime Minister Justin. All right, well, we can show some of the responses now. We'll start off with my sexy librarian. Udo tweeting that the assassination of Shinzo Abe is incredibly shocking, and I'm deeply saddened. He says the world has lost a great man of vision. Uh, no, Shinzo Abe was dog shit, and 
for, from what I understand, like, I don't know, I haven't lived there, so I can't really say on his policies, like, I can criticize his policies, and I'm going to, um, but, you know, his, his grandfather was, like, the, the first prime minister after World War II, who, uh, did some things which we're going to probably talk about later today, which is not, uh, which is not fun stuff. Uh, if anyone knows what 731 is, it's, uh, he's a very, uh, Shinzo Abe was a very big proponent of that. So it, uh, it was not, it's not really cool that, uh, he was a very big proponent of that because, you know, a lot of biological and chemical warfare used against like primarily like Chinese people as well as uh as some Soviets too, so that's not cool. We'll be going over that as well. So let's continue. And Canada has lost a close friend. My thoughts are with his wife, Aki, and the people of Japan as they mourn this loss. You'll be missed, my friend. More reactions coming in from UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson, oi brove. I don't even know why he, Boris Johnson is chiming in. He, uh... He's, he kind of sucks, not gonna lie. So let's see what the... The oi brov has to say. Saying Shinzo Abe's global leadership through uncharted times will be remembered by many. My thoughts are with his family, friends, and the Japanese people. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken also calling Abe's killing profoundly disturbing and a personal loss for so many people. Is there any more TOS in here? I don't think so. I had the opportunity to share, as I just did, uh, uh, my friend uh, Park Jin, the uh, UK Prime Minister, of our deep sorrow uh, at uh, what's, what's happened today. Uh, I have to just say, finally, that um, our thoughts are really with uh, all of his, his family and his friends. Uh, we really, really deeply mourn a loss, a loss for his family, a loss for his friends, a loss for the people of Japan. And former U.S. President Barack Obama also tweeting, I'm shocked and saddened by the assassination of my friend and longtime partner Shinzo Abe in Japan. Former Prime Minister Abe was devoted to both the country he served and the extraordinary alliance between the U.S. and Japan. Now, Abe was 67, hailed from a wealthy political family that included a former... See, there it is. I, I told you he, uh, he came from a political family. A uh, foreign minister father and a grandfather who also served as a premier. Quite a shocking story. Hmm, I wonder what his... Uh, I wonder how old his grandfather was. I wonder. I wonder what his, how old his grandfather was and what time he was prime minister. Oh wait, that's right. I literally just stated that earlier. Story coming out of Japan, Marcia. Indeed, indeed. Okay, Akshay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's move on to some of the more, uh, some more of it. So, yeah. As we turn to the other international news breaking, the assassination of Shinzo Abe. Uh, I'm just gonna double check for TOS. I don't want any TOS shit in here. God damn it! Why does the news always have to show TOS shit? Like, why are they showing fucking people getting just murked? Um. Bay, the former Japanese prime minister. A shocking act of political violence during an election campaign event. A shooting in a country where gun crime is very rare. Yeah, so, like, the one thing about Japan is... Japan doesn't really allow you to own guns. 
which yeah it's why their gun violence is so low but there's also the uh i think in some instances i don't even think police use guns either so they have that going for them well the moment of the attack caught on camera and we're going to begin with that moment you'll see here the smoke from the gunfire that killed abe you do not see him being hit but this is the moment I'm not show i'm not showing that man fuck no Aftermath, these stunning images. Abe shot twice, wounded, bleeding. The suspect tackled by men who appear to be the former Prime Minister's security team. And then there is this picture of the weapon. It appears to be homemade, seemingly built up. So I will show this. This is what murked uh, Abe. So as you can see, it's like clearly duct made out of duct tape and PCB pipe. So, yeah, people are just, some people are just wildly dedicated, man. Out of wood, pipes, and tape. Patrick Falk is on the story for us this morning. Patrick, 503 local time, Shinzo Abe pronounced dead. What do we know about what happened? I think I'm good. Yeah, well, Heather, it really has been a, a shocking and dramatic day of events. As you say, the former prime minister was uh, making a campaign speech in the city of Nara, west of Tokyo, when this attack uh, took place. Uh, as far as we understand, the attacker was only a few meters behind Shinzo Abe when he shot him. Uh, reports say that he was shot in the neck and chest there was a lot of blood at the time uh, security then blanketed the oh, no no nope attacker uh, when he was sent to hospital when he was airlifted to hospital we are told that he was in god damn i hate how they just keep showing the same footage over and over again and like tos shit as well like come on a state of cardiac arrest and that afterwards when he arrived uh, in the hospital so uh arrest and that afterwards when he arrived real quick uh this was the murderer right here the the funny thing is is that 4chan tried to say it was Hideo Kojima that it did it you know the uh the guy who was responsible for making metal gear and like death stranding and shit yeah, that's not true. <laughs> they they tried like implanting Hideo Kojima's face over the killer, which like I mean, of course it's fucking 4chan, like what else is new? Dumbass Nazis. <laughs> uh, in the hospital, the public broadcast NHK said that there were no signs, uh, no vital signs from then on. Uh, attempts had been made as far as we understand, to revive him. And uh, there were blood transfusions made. Uh, but uh, as we understand, nothing uh, worked. And he was, as you say, pronounced dead at 5.03 p.m. local time in Japan. In terms of the reaction, we've been talking about world leaders reacting and we'll continue to bring some of their statements. We will, we will be showing uh, some of the world... Uh, leaders reactions to the death of shinzo abe some of them are actually really funny so we'll have we'll have a lot of fun with that that's in but the japanese people uh the japanese prime minister the current prime minister what an emotional address from him tell us a little bit more about that yeah fumio kishida was really struggling to hold back the emotions earlier today after the shooting happened uh, and he talked about how this uh, was a, a brutal act uh, and another yeah so to me like i'm personally indifferent that he was killed to be honest i i didn't really care too much for him nor did a lot of uh japanese people i know 
So I'm personally indifferent. Plus, like, it doesn't really affect me too much. So I, that's another reason why I don't really care. <sighs> but understandably, uh, the Japanese people are, are are scared of, you know, of it. Uh, from from my friends' reports that live there, they are still like like even though they didn't like him, they're still pretty sh uh, shooken up by it because you know th this is something that just doesn't happen in Japan. So they're still you know kind of paranoid that something like this might happen again. They don't necessarily know if it's going to happen again. But they're definitely on edge. Unforgivable acts, and particularly coming ahead of Sunday's upper house uh, parliament uh, election, he, he said essentially that this was an attack on uh, Japan's democracy. You know, among Japanese people, there's also been widespread disgust at what's happened, and there's a, a hashtag uh, going around on social media saying, We want democracy. Uh, not violence. It's interesting, the suspect, uh, we're still, still trying to find out more details about him. He was apparently a resident of Nara, a 41-year-old uh, that went by the name of Tetsuya Yamagami. Uh, we're hearing that he was uh, a former member of the equivalent of Japan's Navy, and there are some reports saying the police searched his home and they discovered explosives. Uh, there, so there is every possibility that beyond what happened today, he could have been planning further attacks as well. We do await, we understand, a police briefing to come at some point this hour. So we'll be paying attention to that as NARA police speak to reporters and perhaps updates on that suspect and more detail on the weapon and exactly what possible motivation there might have been. Let's talk legacy. And international relations. So, when it came to like international shit, like he was only part of the the G7. Thanks solely for the follow. He was really only part of the G7. So, hey, how's it going? But like outside of that, he didn't really do too much. So, and like he was pretty dog shit in like when he was prime minister as well, so. Uh, Shinzo Abe, the longest serving prime minister in the country, he served two terms. He was very familiar to people around the world, very familiar on the world stage, warm relations with leaders, including Canada's prime minister. We're looking at images alongside Justin Trudeau, for example. Can you speak to that part of the Shinzo Abe legacy? Is there any, is there any more TLS shit in here? Doesn't look like it. it. Looks like it. Patrick. Well, a couple of things he was known in particular for reviving Japan's economy through what became known as Abenomics, which. So, like, this is like one of the main things that they're going to be talking about when they talk about his legacy is that he got them out of a recession, which is true. He did. But, like, a lot of his other po policies generally tended to suck and ended up hurting like the the Japanese proletariat so that's the only thing that he really did it was essentially a mixture of monetary easing and government spending and that legacy very much remains today including uh, a weak Japanese yen uh, he also in particular was known for wanting to change Japan's pacifist constitution and allow Japan to have its own military. The background of the attacker suggests that that may have something to do with the motive, although we can't be sure for certain uh, right now. Uh, he wasn't able to change Japan's pacifist constitution during his leadership of Japan, but he had been campaigning also to boost Japan's military budgets uh, in recent weeks, in particular following the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. But in terms of, you know, relations with other countries, he is known for being a deft statesman and in particular was able to uh, 
maneuver Japan around some of the challenges of the trade war, particularly with developing a close relationship with the U.S. and President Donald Trump, Donald, the former U.S. So, yeah, that's another thing. He also really liked Donald Trump, too, which kind of a self-report there, to be honest. I mean... I like Donald Trump too, for but for different reasons. Uh, he, he was just a, a funny guy. U.S. President said it was devastating news after he heard what happened today, and he said he was a friend of Shinzo Abe's and a true friend of America's as well. We know very much about the relationship with the U.S., but also, as you say, he had a close relationship with Canada. And when Shinzo Abe last met uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in 2019, at, a G7 meeting in Biarritz. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau had uh, thanked him for his leadership and also in particular for ushering through the CPTPP and for creating jobs in both countries. Patrick, <laughs> thank you. We will continue to uh, come shit. back to you for updated information again. The only thing that Shinzo Abe created was a fucking suicide uh, culture in Japan because he was very, very fucking strict about that. We do expect to get some further detail from police in Nara, and we'll have updates ahead as we look live there at the uh, famous Shibuya intersection in Tokyo, and the people there in a country stunned by what is such a rarity, both political violence and gun violence, more... And, you know, they're still, to this day, they're still kind of sh shaken by it, so, you know, it's... Uh, not pretty fucking chill either. To come from Japan today. So. Oh, I have to watch that at some point, man. It's awesome. Uh, I should quickly. I should quickly check. Let me double check things here. Uh. Twenty. Let's get free and good. And then fifty-five. Ten. Yeah, In the I'll last just minute whirl of campaigning for parliamentary elections, Shinzo Abe stumped in the city of Nara. Abe was praising the local candidate when the first shot rang out in a cloud of white smoke. Yeah, so the the first shot missed, which is why all this which is why there's the smoke. He wasn't hit this uh, for this first shot. The next shot he was he was hit and that was the one that that clapped him. It missed him as he turned a second volley struck Abe in the neck. The gunman was tackled to the ground as bystanders rushed to help the bleeding politician. Japan shuddered. I never imagined it could happen here, she says. Abe was airlifted to hospital where he was pronounced dead. Police say the gunman confessed. I did it, he told us. Investigators identified him as 41-year-old Tetsuya Yamagami, a former member of the Japanese Navy. Police say he held a grudge against a group and believed Abe was part of that group. What makes but, like, even though I didn't really like Shinzo Abe too much, I don't really think he deserved this. Like, I, I think no one deserves this, to be honest. Like, there's really no reason for it. But, you know, it, it fucking happens, unfortunately, so. makes this even more unusual is the weapon. So rare is gun ownership in Japan that the killer built his own, wrapping two barrels in electrical tape. So rare is gun violence that only one other person was shot to death in the past year in Japan. I would like we should be good for TOS. All present to stand. Tributes poured in from around the world. A moment of silence at the UN and condolences from Ottawa, where Abe was considered 
a friend of Canada. He was a thoughtful, strong leader who, who understood the importance of service. Abe had a profound impact on his country and the region. Politically a nationalist, militarily a hawk, he aimed to position Japan as a liberal democratic counterweight to China. <laughs> yeah, so that's like one of the main reasons why... Uh, what was their party name called again? I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, the Liberal Democratic Party was in place was to oppose Maoist China and so that they have an ally within the uh within the the eastern area like eastern uh asia well that and like later on at, at like the korean war they had south korea as well Which, you know fucking both of both North and South Korea fucking sucked at the time. We've lost a great politician with many great achievements, says Abe's successor, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. Simply barbaric. And at the scene of the shooting overnight, flowers, offerings of tea and beer, and prayers as shockwaves spread through Japan. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Yeah, so it's kind of crazy that that happened. Yo, there's a new Johnny Harris video, bro. Oh man, there's so much shit we have to do at some point. Vsauce, hell yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna double check for TOS as usual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of this, most of this is like TOS shit, man. Hmm. Can't show the first, what? The first like 50 seconds of this. Eyewitness videos show security pinning the 41-year-old suspect on the ground before carrying him away. Abe was airlifted to the hospital but was pronounced dead despite emergency treatment. He was transported to the emergency center. of uh, Perf Perfectual Medical University at 12.20 p.m. local time today. Uh, this is in Nara uh, and was in cardiac respiratory arrest. Okay, I'm good now. To the rest of this is in TOS. え、
お祈りしたいと思います。私にとりましても、まあ、当選同期であり、えー、国会議員になってからも、まあ、同僚議員として、また安倍内閣を、まあ、支える、まあ、一閣僚として、えー、多くの時間を共にした良き友人でもありました。えー、この国の国未来を切り開くために大きな実績をさまざまでさまざまな分野で、えー、残された偉大な政治家をこうした形で失ってしまったこと重ね重ね、うん、残念でなりません。Yeah, so. So, yeah,、uh, let's move on to some of the world leaders.、Um, let's move on to some of the world leaders'、uh, responses and reactions to Shinzo Abe's death. So, we'll have fun. What's this? How Canada could end. JG man. You got me down the fucking right wing pipeline, man. Uh, I don't think there's TOS shit in here, right? Yeah. Brandon.、Uh, and. Oh shit. I want to offer my condolences、uh, to Aki Abe. The wife of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and to the rest of his family and loved ones. Our thoughts are with you and with the people of Japan today. I've known, I knew Shinzo for many years. He was a thoughtful, compassionate, strong leader who.、Ha. who Understood the importance of service, understood the importance of building a better world, better opportunities for his citizens, but stepping up and getting involved in issues around the world that really, really mattered. He was a great friend and a partner to Canada. He was a man of immense talent, and not just his family. Not just the entire country of Japan, but the entire world feels his loss. Compounded by the fact that to see a senseless act of violence when he was busy doing what he loved in serving his community, serving his country, stepping up in a political campaign is horrifically disturbing. It is important. Bro, I just don't. I just, I just can't, man. It's, it's so dumb. Like, <laughs> as much as I like my sexy librarian, I just, I just can't deal with his response, man.、It's、so fucking cringe. That all of us recommit ourselves to the values and principles of democracy, which hold that yes, there will be incredible diversity of perspectives, of opinions, of views on how we need to go forward. But in a democracy, that is settled not just at the ballot box, at the ballot box. Bro, why do all fucking liberals just say go vote? It's so fucking annoying. God damn it, man. All fucking liberals are the same. But in between times of ballots, through conversation, through dialogue, through speaking our truths, sharing our concerns, but also through listening to each other. And we. You know. I honestly think he's too sexy to do this job. I'm sorry. He's way too sexy to do this. Just go fucking model. 
for fucking McLean's and you know let's sing take over man we must all join together in condemning and pushing back against any threats of violence any threats of intimidation and division that undermine the public space that we occupy in a democracy in which we all feel safe to contribute to share and to serve on days like today, we're reminded again that our world needs more positivity and more hope. Bro, shut up, man. <laughs> oh, man. Bro, you literally fucking, like, opp oppress indigenous people, so <laughs> you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, my guy. I, uh, I tried oh, to let's go, Brandon. To, uh, to the present prime minister. He was very late there and I'll be talking. Jeez, did they like just like fucking unfreeze him from the cryo chamber? Like his mental capacity is like awful. Man. There in the morning. I'm I can't believe Bernie lost to this guy. Assign the condolence book of the Japanese embassy and the way the CIA. Um, <clears throat> this hasn't happened in Japan decades and decades. I, I'm told all, all the way back to the late 30s or mid 30s. And it's a homemade weapon. I've only seen a photograph of it. The Justice Department is going to be going in and getting more detail later as they find out the detail. But um, the fact is that uh, one thing did strike my, uh, get my attention, that this is the first use of a weapon murder someone in, in Japan. And I think we have thus far have 3,000, I won't hold me to the number, 688 or, or maybe between three and 4,000 cases. They have one, one, one. Okay, what the fuck are you gonna do about it, bitch? Y you're just uh, talking about it, but you're not fucking doing anything about it. You're just like fucking being throwing your hands up, not doing shit about all your fucking gun violence. Being like, oh, well, Republicans are whatever, you fucking clown. And so, uh, um, but we're going to learn more about, as time goes on, about motive, about the, the whole. But Japan. You want to know what the motive was? He fucking hated Shinzo Abe and wanted him dead. He shot him dead. That's that. That, that's what the motive was like fuck I, I'm sure that there's like ulterior motives outside of that but like it, it doesn't matter man he's most chances are he's probably gonna die in prison because getting out of prison in Japan like even as a Japanese person is very very unlikely in, in Japan you are guilty and proven innocent and if you're uh, a foreigner, or what they call as gaijin, you are, you're, you're pretty much just guaranteed to be locked up in jail. You're most likely going to lose your trial. That's... Uh, that's just the reality of it. <clears throat> and Fumio, the present prime minister, is a very solid guy. Japan is a very, very stable ally, and uh, we, uh, I, I do not believe it's likely to have, but I don't know yet, likely to have any profound destabilizing impact on Japanese security or Japanese uh, solidarity. Thank you all so much. What, what most likely happened is this guy got like a bunch of fucking American brain rot, or just Western brain rot in general, I guess, and was like, you know, that's pretty cool if these hogs can make uh, a, a, a make, makeshift firearm, you know, I can easily do it, like. Andaksu. South Korea. 
참그뭐이 동북아를 위해서는 어 노력을 열심히 하시다가 결국 돌아가셨다 해서 상당히 아쉽고 또그 가족들한테 진지한 조의를 또 의문을 드리고 싶습니다. She has written a wonderful person, great democrat and champion of the multilateral world, world order has passed away. I mourn with Bro, his... where is all the funny shit? I saw some really funny shit earlier. Like where the hell is it? Even include Boris Johnson. I think a, a lot of the funny shit came from Boris if I remember correctly. Family, his friends and all the people of Japan. This brutal and cowardly murder of Shinzo Abe shocks the whole world. I wish to extend our deepest sympathy and condolences from the government and the people of the Republic of Indonesia to the government and the people of Japan at this time of sorrow. His dedication to serving his country and people will always be remembered as a prime example for all. Start by expressing my sympathy and my thoughts and the sympathy and thoughts of the Australian people. I, I love how like even though like these are just different countries uh like leaders doing it. I, I like how they're all essentially the fucking same. Being like, we're saddened by his death. He was a great ally or he was a great adversary to us. And you no, know, he will be missed. It's they're all the fucking same. They just change up the like aesthetics. And the Australian government to the people of Japan following the passing of former Prime Minister Abe. Mr. Abe has been the closest of friends oh. to Australia. We condemn this shocking act of violence. His death is tragic. It is devastating news for Japan and its people, for Australia and for the international community. <sighs> they didn't show any of the fun shit, man. <sighs> oh, the BBC did one? Okay, let's watch the BBC, man. Japan's former and longest serving prime minister has been assassinated during a campaign rally. Shinzo Abe was shot at close range while making a speech in Nara in the west of the country. He was taken to hospital by helicopter, but doctors were unable to save him. Police arrested a 41-year-old man shortly after the attack. There is shock and disbelief in Japan, which has low rates... Do of they have TOS shit in here? I think they do. It looks like they do some shit. And then they covered, like, all the other... Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, 31 the seconds. violent crime and tough gun laws. From Nara, our correspondent Rupert Wingfield Hayes reports. <laughs> this was Shinzo Abe this morning, standing on a street corner, rallying support for his party in Sunday's parliamentary elections. Lurking a few meters away, this man was caught on camera by a local TV crew. Then suddenly, two very loud bangs rang out. Mr. Abe's bodyguards are on the assailant in seconds. Lying on the street, a strange looking gun made of steel pipes and held together with black tape. It's PCV pipes, not steel. The Prime Minister is flown to a nearby hospital, but the news is bad. He has been hit in the back and neck, and his heart has stopped. This is where Mr. Abe was brought, and this is where doctors worked for hours to try and save his life. And it was from here at a little after five this evening. Okay, I think we're in the clear. That Mr. Abe had died. Tonight, the whole of Japan is in shock. There have been political assassinations here before, but yeah, like that's uh, it's not, it's not just the one. Like, this isn't the first time that uh, there has been, like, political violence. Uh, the Liberal Democratic Party has been known to, like, silence uh, political opponents, uh, primarily, like, leftists. So, or even, like, left-leaning uh, candidates as well. Like, they have such a 
gigantic uh, influence as well as a history of political violence against uh, uh, political opponents, which is not looking cool at all. Nothing like this, certainly not in more than half a century. I was really shocked, this lady says. I never thought a gun would be used. Using a gun in Japan? I've never heard of this. Yeah, to like any of my American viewers, it's the same shit like here. Like, sure, we have like gun violence too, but it's like nowhere near as crazy. Like at most we'll have like, I guess on a good year, it'd be like 10. It's usually like less than that though because of how uh, regulated firearms are here. So, yeah, it's, in Japan, it's like unheard of. It seems guns are becoming more common, her husband says. That makes me feel very sad. Back in Tokyo, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida could barely hold back the tears as he went before the media. <laughs> I prayed that somehow his life would be spared, he says, but unfortunately, ha. it was gone. This is a terrible day. I have Just pray. no words. This evening, police began searching the suspect's home, reportedly finding more homemade firearms, but no clear motive. From around the world, the tributes have been pouring in, from President Joe Biden to Boris Johnson, and Mr. Abe's old golfing partner, Donald Trump. <laughs> she... Bro, what is this photo? Look at them. Oh my God, this is fucking awesome. The fucking Trump look. He looks like. <laughs> he looks way too fucking red, man. <laughs> like, I, I don't understand <laughs> why he's this fucking red. Like. Ugh. And it's Mr. Fucking, Abe's old golfing it's partner, Donald awesome. Trump. Shinzo Abe certainly had his detractors too. Not the least of which was China's president, Xi Jinping. Yeah, if I remember correctly, I, I think Xi Jinping doesn't really like Abe. I... I see why. I, I, I honestly see why in Xi Jinping's case. Because, like, in Japan, there's a very... Very, very anti-China sentiment in in the country as a whole. So, and like, it's been like that for a long time. Like, a very long time. So, I can't even say that. I'm honestly surprised. But he brought Japan and America closer together than ever before. He championed free trade in the Pacific and served his country longer than any other leader. For that, he will be remembered. And Rupert joins us live from Nara. And Rupert, it seems hard to overstate the sheer amount of shock where you are. Absolutely, Jane. It is hard to overstate the amount of shock. This is just not a country of guns and gun violence. To give you an idea, there are on average fewer than 10 gun-related deaths for the whole of Japan each year. And that's why politicians think it's okay to stand on street corners giving speeches without much protection, without screens, without metal detectors, because this sort of crime is just unthinkable here. It's also profoundly shocking because of who it happened to. It's difficult to overstate just what a huge political figure Shinzo Abe was here. He dominated politics in Japan for a decade like no other modern... You know, I'm honestly kind of surprised that he's allowed to not wear a mask in Japan because Japan is very very strict like they're still pretty strict about uh covid laws and restrictions so i'm honestly surprised he's able to do this like if anyone caught him he would be fined out the ass politician and he believed that Japan had to stop taking a back seat stop following other countries like the united states and they're on issues like Asia-Pacific security, free trade, and particularly on the issue of taking on the challenge of China. Mr. Abe believed that Japan had to step up. Uh, it had to once again 
get over its post-war pacifism and become a leading power in Asia. And I think that will be his deepest and longest lasting legacy. Except that he didn't really do anything for that. Like he only opened up trade more to America and that's it. Like when it comes to like Asian powers, honestly, China has that like down pat. They have the population for it. Like they're arguably one of the biggest consumers outside of America as well as a lot of their developments that they have in China as well are getting on par or in some cases better than Japan. Rupert, thank you. Rupert Wingfield Hayes. <sighs> Wait, what's this? They did one on bro what? We have to watch that at some point. Uh, so, so yeah, we'll be moving on to uh, Unit 3731. Uh, but first, let's talk about who Shinzo, Shinzo Abe actually was. As I'd mentioned already, he is Shinzo Abe, Abe uh, was a Japanese politician who served as Japan's Prime Minister and President of the Liberal Democratic Party, which, you know, they just, they're not great, to be honest. From 2006 to 2007, and from 2012 to 2020, he is the longest serving Prime Minister uh, in Japan, in Japanese history. Abe also served as Cabinet Chief from uh, secretary from 2005 to 2006 under Junichiro uh, Koizumi and was briefly uh, opposition leader in, two th in 2012. Uh, Abe was born to a prominent uh, political party in Tokyo and was the grandson of the prime minister uh, Nobushiki uh, no man this is so fucking uh, yeah Yeah, he was born to his grandfather here, who was pretty fucking bad. After graduating from Saike University and briefly attending the University of Southern California, Abe was elected to the House of Representatives in the 1993 election in 2005. Abe was appointed as Chief Cabinet Minister by Koizumi for placing him as Prime Minister of and the LDP president the following year uh, confirmed by National Dyer Abe became Japan's youngest post-war Prime Minister uh, and the first born after World War II Abe resigned as Prime Minister after one year due to uh, yeah, sex, <laughs> and uh, recently lost to uh, and recent losses by his party after uh after recovering Abe's stage an unexpected political comeback after defeating Shiguro uh, Ishaba, the former defense minister, to the. To become the LDP pre uh, president in 2020 or yeah, 20, 2012. Following the LDP's landslide victory in that year's general election, uh, Abe became the first prime minister to return to office since Shiguru uh, Yoshida in 1948. He led the LDP to future victories in 2014, 2017, 
elections, becoming Japan's longest serving prime minister in 2020. He resigned as prime minister, citing a relapse of his clerus uh, and was succeeded by Yoshi uh, Saga or Suga. Abe was a staunch conservative hmm, whom political uh, commentators had described as right-wing nationalist <clears throat> and Japanese nationalist. Hmm. Oops. It's like I had mentioned that before, like how he was like fucking conservative and dog shit and how like as the times went on, no one tended to like him. Associated with uh, Nimpong uh, Kaiji, he held uh, negative views uh, on Japan's history, including denying the role of the government, uh, oration in recruitment of comfort women, which, you know, he, that's one thing that a lot of fucking things like to or a lot of like Japanese people like to gloss over as well as like it's whitewashed in schools in in Japan as well like you know how here in Canada instead of you know uh, talking about like say comfort women in World War Two, we tend to whitewash the genocide of indigenous people or how or how long the residential schools were the last one was closed down in the year I was born in 1998 that's how long they were going for and they started at fucking like before the founding of Canada so we tend to like to whitewash that instead they tend to whitewash comfort women which uh yeah it, it, it's essentially like you know they fucking made uh chinese korean whoever uh sex slaves to pleasure uh the japanese uh force like the japanese imperial uh military in world war ii <clears throat> Uh, a position which caused the tensions, particularly within South Korea, under his uh, pre premiership relations between two, the two uh, further strained. In 2019, when Abe started, stated that any issue concerning Japanese rule of Korea was previously resolved in the 1965 treaty, which no, that's not how treaty. That's not how that works. Uh, and any further request for reformations meant that South Korea had violated the treaty because, like, of course, he's fucking conservative. What else do you expect? Uh, earlier that same year, Abe's government infiltrated a trade war with South Korea after the country's Supreme Court uh, stated that reformations should be made by Japanese companies who had benefited from forced labor abe was also considered a hardline or with respect to japan's military policies which is like another fucking reason why i don't like him as well as like he was literally fucking like hassan had already talked about talked about like uh, this to the to greater extent that i have but he's also a very big proponent of unit 731 which we'll get into. Uh, I'm th I'm thinking maybe next week I'll probably get more into um, like a lot of the f like past uh, tragedies and horrific things that Japan has done. Like the comfort women, we'll be talking about Unit you know, Seven Three One a little bit today, but we'll also be talking about it like next week as well probably as well so there's that 
and yeah, where were we? Uh, in 2007, he was uh, the initiator of the uh, Quadratal Security Dialogue, the Quad, with three other countries during his first tenure as Prime Minister aimed to re resisting China's rise as an economic and military superpower. Again, uh, the, the rise of uh, modern-day China, which I think is more successful than Japan, whether, like, in a lot of regards, like, say, economically, militarily, like, it, China is the only one, like, opposing, like, Japan, or not Japan, uh, America right now, for, like, global superpowers. And, like, the, the irony in that, though, is, like, yes, China is still pretty fucking bad, but, like, I'd rather have China be, like, essentially doing what America is doing because, like, they're less violent and they don't want to fucking, you know, pull a bunch of American shit, like, by, like, fighting proxy wars and just, like, starting wars in general. As well as, like, reprimanding, like, fucking slaves in cobalt mines, for example. Which, don't get me wrong, is still pretty fucking bad. But it's slightly better. He advocated uh, reforming the Japanese self-defense force, the JS JSDF, by resolving Article 9 of the pacifist Japanese constitution that outlawed the country from declaring war. He enacted military reforms in 2015, allowing Japan to exercise collective security and the JSDF uh, deployments overseas as uh, overseas the passage of which was controversial and met with protests. My friends that live in Japan were very, very against the reversing of Article 9. What? Uh, yeah, it was, you know, to so that they couldn't declare war. As well as they were also fairly against, like, the military reforms as well. <clears throat> what were those protests themselves? Yeah. Uh, economically, uh... Economically, Abe's uh, premiership was known for his attempts to counter Japan's economic uh, stagnation, nicknamed Abenomics, which was with mixed results. Uh, Abe was also credited with reinstating the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership with the Comprehensive per uh, Progressive uh, Agreement of trans Pacific partners, I think it's like all Western allies, right? Uh, <laughs> after the uh, after the U.S. had withdrew uh, on the eighth of July, twenty twenty-two, Abe was assassinated by former Prime Minister, uh, former. Uh, Japanese Marine Tain Self Defense Force sailor who was delivering a campaign speech in Nara ahead of the July 10th election. Uh, the suspect was uh, directly targeted Abe because of that, that latter's ties to the Unification Church. So let's that's just a basic rundown of him. Uh, we can get into some of his other terms and like how dog shit he was to like the rest of Asia, as well as a lot of his fucking policies. He was really fucking bad 
in a lot of regards. So... Yeah, he has the favoritism scandal, which was fucking awful. And, you know, controversies as well. But... But yeah, like, I don't really want to go through all of this, but he was very fucking, like, reactionary, which is why, like, personally, I'm indifferent, because, you know, he was pretty fucking bad. So... So yeah, well, so yeah, I don't really care. It's dog shit. So I don't know if there's gonna be TOS in here. Let's just update stuff right now. Um, doesn't look like it. What are you saw extensive cruelty in every shape and every form. The Holocaust may stand as one of the most disturbing events in. So, yeah, uh, this is. So we're going to be jumping into a little bit of Unit 731, uh, who Shinzo Abe was a uh, a proponent of. Uh, Shinzo Abe, essentially, what Unit 731 is is like it's it's the equivalent of uh, it's the Japanese equivalent of if like say a German was to wait or was to was to be uh, like say where or be a proponent of uh, 1488 that's essentially what it what it is I've known about this for a, a very long time um, it is I think it was like one of the first things that my Japanese friends and I had talked about way back when I'm like yeah no that's fucking horrible so We'll be talking about it, or we'll be talking about it a little bit today, as well as we'll be talking about it probably next week as well. Because, you know, provided like something insane doesn't happen, because like I, I do think that when it comes to, uh, when it comes to Japan's like war crimes and shit, they got off pretty scot free. Um. I'm going to quickly pull up Unit 731's Wikipedia page and, and all that. Um, I'm going to double check to see if there's US in here. Doesn't look like it. Yeah, it doesn't really look good. So, what Unit 731 is, is, uh, is short for Manchu uh, Detachment 731, uh, is also known as the uh, Como Detachment, and uh, Ishii Unit. Uh, was a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit used uh, of the Imperial Japanese Army uh, that engaged in lethal human experimentation and biological weapons, manufacturing the Second uh, Sino-Japan War of 
1937 to 1945 and <clears throat> World War II. Unit 731 was based off based in the uh, Pingfon district of uh, Harbin, the la largest city in Japan, uh, in the Japanese puppet state of uh, Manchuriko, uh, now east. Uh, Northeast China. <clears throat> so, uh, for context, Japan had a lot of fucking um, space to play around with when it came to World War II. They had uh, South Korea. They had parts of China, as well as like Indonesia and shit, and like a whole bunch of like little islands. Like, say, like Japan is like here. They also got like a shit ton of little islands over here. It's it's not cool. Uh, and had activated breach of uh, offices through China and Southeast Asia. <clears throat> it was responsible for some of the most notorious war crimes committed by uh, the Japanese for, uh, armed forces. Uh, Unit 731 routinely conducted tests on human beings who were dehumanized and uh, uh, internally referred to as logs. Experiments included disease injections, controlled dehydration, uh, hyperphobic chamber experiments, biological weapons testing, Dislocation, amputations, and weapons testing. So, the thing that happened after World War II is like people obviously know about like Operation Paperclip, which is where you know America brought in a lot of fucking Nazis, like like a lot of like ex Nazi silent scientists in order to fight off the greater opposing um, force after World War II, which was, you know, the USSR. Uh, don't get me wrong, the Soviets did that too, which is not okay at all. Um, but no, uh, they also brought in uh, Japanese people, for, or Japanese uh, war criminals who also fucking worked at Unit 731, as well as like a whole bunch of other shit, that, or a whole bunch of like other fucking war criminals too, but what else, what else do you expect? Victims included babies, children, and pregnant mothers. Uh, victims were from different nationalities, but majority of them were Chinese. Uh, the second largest uh majority that they had done this with is with the soviets that's the second biggest nationality that they had experimented on as well as like you had koreans in there as well and then like and then like war and then like criminals that or like people that they deem criminals like some of the allied forces that they caught like I imagine that there was American soldiers in there as well as uh, British and like just anyone in general, provided that they weren't killed. Uh, additionally, Unit 731 uh, produced biological weapons that were used in areas of China not occupied by Japanese forces, which included Chinese cities and towns, water sources and fields. Estimates of those killed by uh, Unit 731 is, and its related programs range from half a million people. <clears throat> uh, it was officially known as the Epidemic uh, Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Iwantong Army, originally set up by the Kimpitai Military Police of the Imperial Japan, Unit 731, was taken over and commanded until the end of the war by General 
Hashiro Ishii, a combat medic officer in the Kelantong Army. Uh, the facility <coughs> itself was built in 1935 as a replacement for the Zihongma fortress that Ishii and his team used it to expand their uh, capabilities like which is not fucking cool at all uh, the program received generous support from the Japanese government until the end of the war in 1945 uh, unit 731 and the other forces of the epidemic prevention and water purification department operated biological weapon pr uh, production testing deployment in storage facilities while well, unit 731 researchers were arrested by soviet forces and <clears throat> one interesting thing about those who were arrested by the soviet forces they actually want to be tried in american courts instead of soviet courts <clears throat> uh arrested by soviet forces were tried at the December 1949, uh, and I'm going to butcher this because I do not know Russian at all, the Kharabha uh, war crime trial, those captured by the United States were given immunity. Hmm. Hmm. In exchange for data gathered during their human experiments, the United States covered up the human experimentations and handed uh, sp uh, Spaniards to the predators on trial. The Americans cooperated uh, research, or the, the Americans cooped the research of bioweapons information. Uh, and experiments for the use of their own biological warfare program, much as they had done for Germany in Operation Paperclip. So, yeah, it's not pretty cool. They did also try and burn down the... Uh, they did also try and burn down the, the fucking facility uh so yeah that's not cool um so yeah some of the other uh uh experiments that they did were like pe burying people alive like um actually it's, it just says right here uh deprived of food water to determine the length of until death placed into low pressure chambers until their eyes popped out of their sockets which is fucking gruesome experimented upon uh to determine whether relationship between temperature burns and human survival hung upside down until death crushed by heavy objects uh electrocuted dehydrated with hot fans uh placed into configurations that spawn until death injected with animal blood uh notably with horse blood exposed to lethal doses of x-rays subjected to various chemical weapons inside gas chambers injected with uh, seawater and burned or buried alive in addition uh, chemical agents that <coughs> chemical uh, in addition to chemical agents the pro uh, the properties of many different toxins were also investigated in, by the unit if you to name a few prisoners were exposed to Uh, f Fugu Venom, Heroin, Kareem Blindweed, uh, Bacterial, and Castor, uh, Oil Seed. So yeah, not only did they do that, they also, like, did frostbite testing as well, which is fucking psychotic syphilis testing, you know, rape and forced pregnancies it's it's just a fucking awful thing that they had done they're all pieces of shit like i'm sorry 
so let's actually so now that you know like the history of units like the basic histories of unit 731 let's jump into some of these videos history but the conflict also involved numerous other examples when humanity steps not oh, uh. not only well over the line but into an area that can only be described as heinous and our story today is one such example with a name like the epidemic prevention and water purification department you might i'm just gonna double check to see if there's any tos in this Mm. Doesn't look like it. I'd be forgiven for thinking that Japan's Unit 731, to use its informal name, was an admirable group fighting the good fight. But you couldn't be more wrong. To put it bluntly, the actions of this covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit, which regularly involved lethal human experimentation on males and females ranging in age from newborns to the elderly, were some of the dark. It, it, it looks like sexy Vsauce. <laughs> <coughs> I love I love how he looks like sexy Vsauce. I mean, don't get me wrong, Vsauce is already pretty sexy, but he looks like a more sexy uh, Vsauce. Kissed in a war filled with darkness. When we think of World War II, we often simply focus our attention on the European theater of conflict. If you ask your good friend Google when the Second World War began... So, the thing is, is like, there has been a lot of turmoil in Asia. Like, a lot of people, like, a lot of, like, uh, people from European descent that live in North America generally tend to look at like the European side of things and maybe the Soviet side of things as well and often gloss over the uh the Asian side of of World War II or just in general there has been a lot of conflict in Asia like in World War II, and even like before and after. Uh, primarily be like due to like Japan and China. A lot, uh, you know, it was mostly from like, um, like the fascist regime that was in Japan at the time and, uh, and Maoist, uh, and like the communist party in china like not today's modern communist party that's like more like liberal i in my opinion they tend to be like i'm talking like more maoist and you will invariably be shown the date 1st of september 1939 the date german tanks rumbled into poland sparking declarations of war by both britain and france if you're a European, I suppose that this makes perfect sense. However, by this point, a war had been raging thousands of miles away. Yep, and it was caused by Japan, and I believe it was in... I believe it, we already covered this. It was uh, in China. For quite some time. Yes, even here, dates surrounding the beginning of the Asian side of the global conflict can be a little conflicting. The Japanese invaded Chinese Manchuria on the 18th of September 1931, but this was a much smaller operation than what was to come and saw the Japanese annex the area before setting up a puppet government. Six years later, however, the Second Sino-Japanese War erupted after the Marco Polo Bridge incident in which a Japanese soldier, Private Shimura Kikujiro, temporarily disappeared, giving the Japanese army the perfect excuse to cross the border to investigate. Private Kikujiro soon re- like the thing is is like that it, it, that's very like up in the air so it appeared perhaps it was the worst timed toilet break in history or maybe the japanese fabricated the entire thing to find an excuse to start the war either way it's a full military do. conflict was now underway a full two years before it's what fascists do like they'll use like any small crumb that's against like their opponent or they'll just to you know like justify violence or war or they'll fucking uh pull a bunch of other shit and just fabricate it 
Hitler's border crossing escapades in Poland. The Second Sino Japanese War and the Japanese occupation of mainland China saw brutality on a scale that rivaled the Nazis and sometimes even beat Herr Hitler into second place. The Battle of Shanghai, which began on the 13th of August 1937, was the first major conflict between the two sides and set a pattern that would be repeated countless times in the early stages of the war. The spirited Chinese defense, but ultimately a crushing victory by the Japanese. But this war soon took a dark turn with the events that occurred in and around the city of Nanjing in December 1937 and January 1938. The number of Chinese civilians that remained in Nanjing when the Japanese military overran the city has been debated ever since, with confusion over how many had already fled and just how many were now sheltering within the Nanking safety zone, a series of small areas mainly encompassing foreign embassies that, rather ironically, had been set up by a member of the Nazi party. While mm -hmm. the number of how many killed during the Nanjing massacre can be debated, the lowest estimate seems to be 30,000 and the highest 300,000, the savagery of what occurred has long been... Bro, come on, man. I feel so... Clear. Mass murder and mass rape enveloped the city as Japanese soldiers indiscriminately tore through Nanjing. It provided one of Man, fucking history is so fucking violent, man. See, uh, yeah, I know what I'm gonna do. Um bum bum bum. Uh, let's see here. I'm just gonna mark down a bunch of timestamps. Stuff that could be potentially be TOS. <sighs> da, da, da. Hmm. This is crazy. I hate the fact that there's so much fucking shit that I have to go through. That is the time, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that's all of them. One of the most horrifying episodes across the entire war, but by this point, the Japanese have begun something arguably even worse. I think it's to begin the story I think it's of good. Unit 731. We need to backtrack a little. To I, the think Japanese it, I, I think we're good now. I have all the stuff on a sticky note that could potentially be TOS, so it should be it now. Manchuria. In 1931. At that point, there was an army unit with the name Army Epidemic Prevention Research Laboratory, which, as far as we know, began life as an innocent research and public health agency that dealt with protecting Japanese soldiers from chemical attacks on the battlefields. But this changed in 1932 when Surgeon General Shiro Ishii, Chief Medical Officer. Which we did talk about, by the way. It's fucking. The shit they done was horrific. Piece of shit. Of the Imperial Japanese Navy was placed in charge of this unit and formed a secret subgroup under the name 
Togo unit, perhaps after General Hideki Togo, the Japanese politician and general of the Imperial Japanese Army, who had received the bulk of the blame for starting the war with the United States. The Togo unit was tasked with investigating and developing biological and chemical warfare from the Zongma Fortress, a prison slash experimentation camp in Beini, a village 100 kilometers, that's 62 miles south of Harbin on the South Map. And, and do keep in mind, None of this stuff is taught in Japanese schools. My Japanese friends had to, like, literally look into this shit themselves because of how whitewashed it is. Manchurian Railway. This was a tiny village of around 300 homes, which the Japanese burned to the ground before expelling the local population, leaving only a large building that subsequently became the headquarters of the Togo unit. Around the building, the Japanese constructed a prison camp that included a three meter high earthen wall topped with electrified barbed wire and a moat with a drawbridge. Inside, numerous buildings were erected, including housing units, barracks, and dining halls, but also laboratories, warehouses, and prison cells. This is all built with slave labor, mainly common criminals captured. I mean, like, of course it was done with slave labor. Is, like, anyone really surprised by it? Like, it's fucking World War II by a fascist regime. Of course it's going to be done by, by slaves. And its anti-Japanese partisans and political prisoners, all of whom were forced to wear blinders, like what you see on working horses, so they couldn't get a full idea of what was being constructed. Those involved in the construction of the most secretive buildings were executed as soon as work was completed. It had a capacity of a thousand, but it's thought that the prisoner population, who were referred to as logs because of the cover story that the site was a wood mill, usually hovered around 500 or 600. And here is where the horror begins. Once completed, there, for, for context, like a lot of the shit, like even prior to this, is still very, very horrific. And like, I'm glad that, I, I'm sort of glad and like not glad that, you know, we don't hear too much about this shit in general, especially like now. But, you know, at the same time, I'm sure that this shit still happens. Like, I can't really say that I'm surprised, especially by, like, fucking Western forces, too. So. Like, just, like, like only just recently, like, we've been discovering fucking fuck tons of unmarked graves uh, from residential schools. And, like, indigenous people are speaking out about about that shit like but it doesn't matter because they're gonna get fucking clapped by the government anyways so the japanese began rounding up prisoners often criminals from the nearby area mainly chinese but also a large number of russian expatriates living in china they were brought to the zongma fortress and initially treated well with as well as like some koreans too uh as well as uh, prisoners of war uh whether they be like european or like north american good food, including rice or wheat, meat and fish, and even a splash of alcohol to warm the body. But this was simply a disturbing attempt to bring the body into its natural healthy state before the experiments could begin. Now, I know that if you've come to a channel called Into the Shadows, you're probably expecting some pretty heavy material, but what occurred at the Zongma Fortress and its later incarnations was revulsion on an entirely different level. It was here that Japanese doctors and scientists conducted experiments on the prison population that looked at everything from the effects of the plague, cholera, starvation, water deprivation, frostbite, new weapons, and much more. This was a sadistic house of horror, but the Zongma Fortress was just the start, and we'll be going into some of those experiments. I think we're getting closer, right? Video. I think we got it. In the summer of 1934, around 40 prisoners escaped the Zongma Fortress. Heavy rain which is surprising. the electrical fences, allowing escapees to scale the perimeter despite being shackled at the feet. Ten were immediately killed by the guards on duty, while many were dragged back in to be subjected to the kind of torture that probably made their early experience in Zongma seem like a holiday camp. However, 16 prisoners managed to elude the Japanese I think we're into the neighboring countryside. getting close. And with that, Japan's dark secret 
was out. In response, Zong Ma was closed in 1935, but this simply led to another, even larger facility. Yeah, we're getting to TOS. Bang, approximately 24 kilometers south of Harbin. The following year, the Togo unit received a major shakeup and came under the direct jurisdiction of the Imperial Army while being divided into two the Ishii unit and the Wakamatsu unit. Initially, together, they were known as the Epidemic Prevention Department, but from August 1940, it was referred to as the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department. Of yeah, which is just like, you know, not fucking cool. Uh, they did that more or less as a cover up for what the fuck they were doing, so. Don't be surprised by, like, any of this shit. The Kwantung Army, or Unit 731. At its largest, Unit 731, stationed in Pinfang, was composed of 300 researchers, including doctors and bacteriologists, who would sometimes publish their findings in peer-reviewed scientific journals, failing to mention that many of the experiments were done on humans and not monkeys, as was stated. But this was just one section of a much larger, grim web that eventually included around 10,000 people across numerous units stationed in Manchuria, but also elsewhere, including Unit 1855 in Beijing, Unit EI-1644 in Nanjing, Unit 8604 in Guangzhou, and later Unit 9420 in... Okay, like, I actually... I didn't know about these, though. Like, like, I knew about, like, 731 because it's, like, the most popular out of them, but, like, these ones I had no idea about. I, I don't even think, like, a, a lot of my Japanese friends that, like, dug into, like, past uh, Japanese war crimes know about this shit. I, like, maybe they do. I don't know. I'd have to ask, but there's just so many of them. Fuck, dude. Singapore. The main location for Unit 731 was the site in Harbin, which measured 6 square kilometers, that's 2.3 square miles, and included more than 150 buildings, many of which were factories used to produce chemicals or biological agents, and the Harbin complex could produce 30 kilograms of bubonic plague bacteria in just a few days. It was said that it included around 4,500 containers used to raise fleas, six enormous cauldrons to produce various chemicals, and around 1,800 large containers to produce biological agents. The typical Although life expectancy of prisoners in Unit 731 was about two months, though there were instances of some surviving for as long as 12 months, but these cases were often pregnant women who the Japanese wanted to give birth in order to investigate the effects of various diseases on the newborn child. And before we move on to... How the fuck was all this shit just hand-waved by Western forces? Like, the fuck? This is not cool at all. To talk about the experiments themselves, let's just be very clear about what kind of facility we're talking about here. Nobody who came through the gates as a prisoner ever left alive. And more TOS shit. The no. darkest actions carried out under the guise of Unit 731 came under the code name Maruta, meaning logs, and very wildly. It's difficult to know where to start in this pit of absolute hell, so let's just get straight into it. Many of the early experiments focused on how the body reacts to certain diseases, and many prisoners were infected with syphilis, gonorrhea, and other venereal diseases. And that was just the start. While the Japanese were Yeah, they did a whole fuck ton more of, like, biological testing, too. As well as, you know, fucking uh, other insane tests, like fucking frostbite uh, shit as well. Yeah, it's just fucking horrific. And, like, this is only one of the many, by the way certainly interested in the visible external effects, it was often what was happening inside the body that they were really interested in. Vivisections, where the body is dissected for experimental purposes, was a common practice in Unit 731 on living humans, always without anesthetic and with a rag stuffed into the mouth of the poor soul going under the knife to muffle the screams. This was done so researchers could examine the effect of certain diseases on different bodily organs. But there has certainly been plenty of suggestion that at least some of the horror seen in Unit 731 was done so purely for sadistic pleasure. And it gets even weirder from here. Sometimes limbs would be amputated and reattached at different places on the body or internal organs removed and then added back in, but in different locations. Other prisoners were subjected to chemical weapons testing, including mustard gas, leucite, cyanic acid gas, white phosphorus, atom sight, and 
phosgene gas. Sometimes this was done in secure chambers, while there were widespread reports of large-scale experiments on the effects of mustard gas where prisoners were tied to posts outside. This was also done with plague, cholera, typhoid, and anthrax before it was taken to the next stage of testing, which was usually done on a live Chinese population, either through poisoned wells, aircraft drops, or fleas and other animals that have been infected with the disease. You know, honestly, at this point, like, the amount of shit that, you know, China has had to endure, I think China deserves to be where it's at. Like, not only did they have, like, a fuck ton of, like, uh, not just infighting within China itself, as, but they also had a lot of external uh, adversary, adversaries in the fucking East as well. So, like, I, I'm not surprised that it only took, like, until, like, after Mao to, you know, st get the ball rolling to where China is now. But, yeah, no, like, China has not had good times <laughs> in history, so... While the Japanese were eager to test the next generation of weapons that could kill thousands in one fell swoop, they didn't neglect the tried and tested. Prisoners were used to test new grenades, flamethrowers, and even bombs, which saw prisoners tied to posts at increasing distances from the explosion so that the damage radius could be measured. With new guns and bullets, wound patterns and penetration depths were carefully recorded, and the same was done with bayonets, knives, and swords. Experimentation regarding hypothermia was also a keen subject of interest in Unit 731, and typically involved limbs of prisoners being submerged in icy water until they were effectively frozen solid. Then researchers, or sadistic lunatics, depending on how you want to call them, experimented to find the best way of... I mean... Like, I'm not gonna deny, like... There have been some benefits towards this research being done, but no, it's like, you should not be fucking doing that to people. Like, I'm sorry. It's psychotic. And anyone who fucking says that that uh, research was necessary to, you know, like, whatever the, whatever the fucking reason that they try and justify it, that's more, that's more of a fucking self-report. Eating the limb to return it to its normal state, sometimes using fire or boiling water, and sometimes simply leaving the poor wretch overnight to see what would happen. And yet, I feel like I've said this already, that wasn't the worst of it. The Japanese also did extensive experimentation to find out how quickly the human body would suffer from hypothermia and then die of exposure. They introduced different variables, such as when the prisoner had last eaten and what they had and what they were wearing and how much salt and protein they had no. before the experiment. To perhaps sum up the horrifying actions of Unit 731 in one dreadful example, they found that a newborn baby would die in roughly three days if left unattended outside. And I know that that seems like a lot, but that's just scratching the No, surface. that's that's Other like that's like fucking nothing, man. Like a lot of that shit is It's just fucking It's not cool. Experiments include giving prisoners the wrong blood transfusion or the blood of animals, injections of seawater, the human body Yeah, uh when it came to the blood of animals, it was generally horses that did that, but they also did inject with other types of uh animals as well but the the main common one was horses body's tolerance for g-force using a rotating chamber prolonged x-ray exposure rape and forced pregnancy and probably a whole lot more that we'll never completely know about the, pr the prolonged uh x-ray exposure uh it all it oftentimes led to death so yeah I guess they wanted to know how much, like, fucking x-rays it would take to to kill someone. There were even horrific stories of bodies and body parts being pickled in formaldehyde, with the only labels visible being the nationality of whoever was inside. That's fucked up. <laughs> yeah, so... A, a lot of Japanese war crimes were covered up by... Uh, American forces, as well as like some European ones as well. It was mostly American. Uh, they did something similar to Operation Paperclip, where instead of, uh, you know, fucking taking Nazi scientists into America, they took in these psychopaths into America. 
With Japanese hopes fading towards the end of World War II, there appears to have been high-level discussion regarding the use of chemical or biological weapons against the Allies and even on the US mainland. This would be done using information and methods taken from the research done by Unit 731. It's impossible to say how close this actually came, though an attack codenamed Operation Cherry Blossom at night, which called for a biological attack on Southern California, was certainly of some degree of planning when Japan surrendered in September 1945. As the war ended and Japan surveyed its destroyed country, Unit 731 was disbanded and its facilities in Manchuria and on the Japanese mainland were destroyed along with much of the information regarding what had happened there. Prisoners remaining in the camps after Japan's surrender were quickly executed and their bodies disposed of. But this was not something you could keep under wraps. When the Americans arrived in Japan, rumors of chemical and biological testing swirled, but little to no information was openly given to the Americans, for obvious reasons. It was only when the threat of Soviet involvement and no doubt vicious vengeance came into play that Japan's dark secrets surrounding Unit 731 were shared with the United States. A dossier detailing what occurred soon found its way to the desk of General Douglas MacArthur, the man tasked with rebuilding Japan, and some big decisions needed to be made he was a very staunch anti-capitalist as well so or not anti-capitalist <laughs> no he was very fucking capitalist uh he's he was a very staunch anti-communist so and helped uh like not only keep the fucking emperor in charge as well as he created the the ldp the possible prosecutions if there were ever war crimes committed it was under the dark scope of Unit 731. However, the end of World War II saw an almost immediate pivot away from past enemies and towards new ones. For the Americans, the Japanese were no longer the enemy, and they would do whatever they could to make life hard for those devious Soviets. General MacArthur authorized blanket immunity for those who worked in Unit 731 in exchange for sole ownership of the information and findings which the United States deemed hugely valuable. In the Tokyo trials, which saw 28 Japanese military and political leaders tried for a variety of crimes, there was only a single solitary mention of chemical poisoning in occupied China and absolutely nothing about probably the worst Macar experimentation unit across the entire war. The Soviets weren't at all satisfied with this and instigated their own trials known as the Khabarovsk War Crimes Trial. Okay, so that's how you pronounce that. I wasn't sure how to pronounce that because I don't fucking know Russian, man. Which began in <coughs> December 1949. A total of 12 men were convicted of war crimes and sentenced to between 2 and 25 years in Siberian labor camps. Now, you might be thinking, well, at least they got what they deserved, but... Well, not really. They didn't. Considering what happens in Unit 731, these sentences were extraordinarily lenient. And would you know it, most of those convicted soon found their way back to Japan, reportedly after handing over some of the secrets from Unit 731 to the Soviets. The United States refused to acknowledge the Karbovsk trials, labeling them as Soviet propaganda, but it's crystal clear that both the US and the Soviet Union let those responsible for the horror in Unit 731 off the hook. Which I, I'm not okay with. Like, it, I, I don't agree with it when the Americans did it, and I don't agree with it when the Soviets did it. Did it. Did it. Uh, it's not okay either way. So the fact that, you know, both sides have used it is fucking idiotic to me. For their own gain. What followed was decades of near silence in Japan, with successive governments denying all knowledge of the activities of Unit 731. But by the turn of the millennium, with more and more people speaking out about it, including those who had worked there, it was only a matter of time. In August 2008, the Tokyo District Court ruled for the first time that Japan had engaged in biological warfare and directly named the work done by Unit 731. In 2018, after a request by Professor Katsuo Nishiyama of the Shiga University of Medical Science, the National Archives of Japan released the names of 3,607 members of Unit 731, all of whom had lived freely since the end of the war, and many of whom had since died. Apart from the 12 men who faced the ethically shaky Soviet trial in 1949, absolutely nobody was ever held accountable for their actions of the unit. In fact... And, and that's just crazy to me. Like, uh, of course they weren't going to be held accountable. Like, why the fuck would they? They were... Uh, of course they were let off the hook. Because that's what we do with fucking fascists. And fucking psychopaths that do this kind of shit. Many of them went on to quite illustrious careers in post-war Japan. 
In 2002, at an international symposium on the crimes of bacteriological warfare in China, the number of people deemed to have been killed through Japanese chemical and biological warfare programs was estimated at 580,000. And that includes those killed through attacks outside the walls of Unit 731, as well as those inside. It's impossible to know the true number of those killed by Unit 731, but it's thought that at least three... It's, it's the same thing with, you know... Uh, how many people had died in the Holocaust, for example, as well, because that's also a very hard number to actually get, as well as, like, a lot of fucking uh, propaganda and shit that was oftentimes used uh, by fucking Nazis, like, still to this day, about, about it. 3,000 men, women, and children were experimented on and killed in the Ping Pang site alone. This is not a place where anybody left alive. Everybody who walked through the gates died one way or the other. The vast majority of these were Chinese, but large numbers of Russians and Koreans also perished in the facilities. Along See, I, I told you it was also Koreans as and like uh, other nationalities as well. Uh, I don't think he's going to mention like uh, the quote unquote war criminals that the, the, Jap the Imperial Japanese Army had thought of. Along with lesser numbers of Mongols, Americans, British, and French. See, I said right at the start of today's video that World War II delivered some sickening events and despicable cruelty, but the actions of Unit 731 were on a different level. This wasn't just blind torture, and most of the experiments came with very particular purposes that in some ways actually managed to further scientific understanding, both for peaceful and military means, which is why both the US and the Soviet Union were so eager to gain access to the information. This may have been done under the shadowy guise of scientific experimentation, but it was some of the most sadistic, cruel science that you're ever likely to see. Mm-hmm. He is right about that. The good video. I have worse calls of all time. Okay, uh, I'm gonna... Look for TOS. Maybe there won't be TOS in this. Nope. There is a little bit of TOS. So yeah, it, it's kind of hard to believe that we got on this topic uh, due to the Shinzo Abe uh, shit. Bro, this is just like all still images of TOS. I don't know if I can watch this. I don't think I can watch that. So, I'll probably watch it on my free time. Um, so, I guess let's talk about the Roger outages. Because some of the other shit I can't watch. TOS. So, with, with the Roger outages that happened on Friday, the, uh, half of the country, at least, wasn't able to access, like, internet and their phone, but everyone, because for whatever fucking reason, it was a good idea to give private companies access to emergency lines or emergency hotlines like say 911 for example uh, apparently it's a good idea to give them to private companies and let them do whatever the fuck they want with them so 911 was down all across Canada on Friday not only that debit machines were down too because I don't know why the fuck 
Rogers controls all of this shit. This is what happens when you get a monopoly or have a monopoly on shit. One thing goes down, everything goes down. But we're we're pretty chill with it, so let's fucking jump into this. Across the country, a desperate search for a signal. The day thrown into turmoil. I woke up and I thought maybe I haven't paid my bills or something like that. My schedule is usually jam packed. I've got, you know, clients and things all the time. So I'm sure a lot of them need to get a hold of me and can't. So it's kind of a little bit worrisome for sure. Untethered from the online world, people saw it an internet oasis anywhere they could. This library north of Toronto was swarmed by those who usually work from home. So many that they overwhelmed the server. For two years and a half, I never, I never experienced something like this, but uh, there's always the first time. The Rogers network went down early Friday morning, wireless, cable and internet affecting every corner of Canada. At this pharmacy in Fredericton, work ground to a halt. My ability to uh, process prescriptions, bring people through the cash register, is, uh, answer phones. is And like, the thing is, is like, when it came to um, the fucking, when it came to the, uh, When it came down to like the phone and everything down, I didn't really have too much of a problem with that because I'm with Telus, fortunately, so I didn't have to worry about everything being down. Um, and yeah, it's you weren't able to dial nine one one. You weren't able to fucking use debit cards. Talk to my physiotherapist about uh, about this yesterday uh, apparently credit cards as she said credit cards were accept accepted uh as well as like cash but like who the fuck wants to go around with like a shit ton of cash like i'm not fucking 70 years old I i'm not a fucking conspiracy theorist and i'm not a fucking i'm not a fucking drug dealer like why the fuck would i need uh to carry like a fuck ton of cash on me i like carry maybe a hundred bucks in cash on me maybe it i don't Ooh, excuse me i i just fucking think this is outrageous and the the emergency services hotlines whether it be like suicide or fucking 911 or whatever else, I, I think that all should be uh, fucking government, not fucking Rogers. It's psychotic. Completely non existent at the moment. The ripple effect meant payment systems like Interact were down. A major hit to the bottom line for some. I'm just a little small fry down here, but there's lots of small businesses um, that thrive on tourism and we have a short window. Police warned Rogers customers could have trouble calling 911. Uh, and some hospitals asked staff to come in for on-call shifts, others redirected patients. For travelers, there were problems with the Arrive Can app and airline call centers were down. Look at this situation. Apparently, we are all connected, depends on the internet right now. That's really scary. Rogers went down early Friday morning around 5 a.m. But it didn't send out its first statement, a tweet, until almost four hours later. We are focused very, very hard on obviously understanding that root cause. The company has apologized and said it had let down its customers. Ha. We don't yet understand the root cause of, of why this has happened. We don't understand how the, uh, the, the, the different levels of redundancy that we build across the network coast to coast have not, um, have not worked. Steve, we're getting a bit of an update tonight from Rogers, though, on where things stand. Some good news tonight, Vashi, and it came to us through our IT department, not through uh, Rogers' public channels. They say that their core networks were down, but they are starting to recover, so some people should see service, but that recovery is happening, slow, happening slower than uh, anticipated. And Rogers says that in the past, after previous outages, they have provided credits to customers, and they will do so this time around and they will provide information on that at a later I, I would actually be surprised if they did that like half the country uses rogers it, it's either rogers or it's fucking uh bell 
like those are your two options and they're pretty much and they're like both pretty shit unless you have like local or use one of the smaller uh telecom companies like say telus so i would be genuinely surprised if they actually provide credits your date provided of course you actually have an internet connection so you can see their online posts on that Bashi. thanks so much steve the cbc's steven de souza this outage also raises the question about why there isn't a backup system in place. And as Renee Filippone shows us, it's reigniting a broader conversation about Canada's telecommunications industry. Yeah, it's dog shit. As well as like, you know, fucking Rogers wants to merge with Shaw. Uh, that, you know, that whole situation is not, not fucking fun. Yeah, it's... It's fucking crazy. For so many, cut off from the digital world, a major realization. We depend too much on it. <laughs> like, way too much. <laughs> and calls for major change. I think once the outage is over, we shouldn't miss this opportunity to... Re I, I, think what, I, I think what they should be doing, or the government's response to this should be, is they should be making a uh, publicly available... Uh, cell and internet service for one because like it was f fucking f uh researched and funded with public funds as well as you know have it like be a m much cheaper option compared to fucking rogers or bell or telus or shaw or whoever the fuck like if you if you make it like e even if you make it like cheap and like dog shit it'll still be like uh, having that option will make the telecom companies be more competitive with their prices so and like i honestly think that you know that services like 911 should be on that on that or have its own separate uh thing just in case if this happens again reimagine how we provide these services and who provides them and how we can achieve more competition there is little choice for canadian consumers with just three major national telecommunication providers rogers bell and telus this is not the first major outage for rogers last year a similar failure was caused by a software update this expert says there needs to be a better backup plan. The first would just to be to ensure that we had the right analog backup systems, right? We need to have pen and paper, you know, offline options for the services that we're providing as much as possible. Second, I would like to see a publicly owned at least backup system for these services. There are also concerns about how things have been communicated with customers. They were very um, cryptic about uh, the source of the problem. Um, they didn't seem to indicate whether they had an <sighs> estimate for when it would come back online or even what it was about. The Public Interest Advocacy Centre, a consumer advocate, has filed a request with the CRTC to open an inquiry into what happens. No, there's always political will when there's popular will. So if, uh, if consumers are very unhappy about this, if they can focus their anger and take the bro conservatives or er, conservatives consumers have been fucking pissed off with telecom telecom comp companies for years probably at least a decade because of how outrageous the fucking phone bills are but they don't fucking listen uh, the politicians are gonna do fuck all a time to contact their member of parliament all this at a time when Rogers is trying to grow and take over Shaw Communications. That would make it the biggest telecommunications company in Canada. But the merger is being held up by the Competition Bureau. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. I honestly think the fucking merger shouldn't go through, to be honest. Rogers definitely in the hot seat today, but a lot of questions also for the federal government. We are now joined by Innovation Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne. He's in Tokyo, Japan. Minister, thanks for being with us. I know you, you tweeted out that you spoke to Rogers' CEO. What did you say? Well, I share the frustration of millions of Canadians 
uh, this outage has affected consumers, uh, has affected citizens, uh, people who want to do banking. And obviously, first, I share uh, the frustration. The second thing, obviously, being clear that this is, is unacceptable. And the third thing is, is to be in solution mode. Not only I spoke to him, but I spoke to the C of TELUS, the C of Bell, uh, to make sure that we have the best experts in the world uh, willing to help uh, to get to the bottom of this. Uh, I know from the company they're still investigating uh, the, the cause uh, of this outage in their uh, system. And, and certainly everyone uh, is working now on, on getting that uh, back live as quickly as possible and making sure that when they go back live, that there's additional capacity in other networks so it doesn't have a rippling effect on other networks in Canada. Just to be clear, I know that the company is still trying to identify the cause. Does the government have reason to believe uh, there's a cyber attack here? Well, we can't exclude it at this point. Uh, the best experts in the world are, are looking at that. It's not likely. Uh, and like I said, they've been uh, reaching out to experts around the world. Everyone uh, is looking into that to make sure that we can restore services. Millions of Canadians have been impacted. And that's priority number one as we speak is to get back online, make sure that, that we have additional capacity in terms of data in the other networks, making sure that uh, all experts that we can find around the world can look into that. And, and or just like fucking allow like other fucking companies that aren't fucking Canadian to come in. Like, I don't give a shit if it's like an American telecom company. Like, look, it, it doesn't matter. Allow fucking other competition outside of our dog shit three Canadian companies, telecom companies, to f fucking provide shit for the Canadian people. Or fucking open up a public option. I would rather have the fucking public option, to be honest. And get back uh, a service that can even... But, like, knowing the liberals, they'll fuck it up. Like, everything else that they do. And it'll be just fucking awful. Canadians ...deserve as quickly as possible. And it just shows to all of us and Canadians that, that we need quality, uh, that we need diversity and reliability in our network. Uh, this is impacting everyday lives of Canadians. And I can assure you that uh, everyone is working on that to, to make sure we get back online quickly. I do want to ask you more specifically, though, when you use the word diversity. Ooh. I think you're right that a lot of Canadians are thinking about the need for diversity in the market, which does not exist right now. This is a heavily monopolized market. Why has... Like a lot of things in, in Canada. Like a lot of fucking things are monopolized in Canada. Like, the telecom companies, fucking, um, like a lot of the fucking elk products. Because, you know, we can't fucking import, like, any fucking foreign milk. Like, other shit like that. It's so fucking dog shit. Has your government allowed only three carriers to dominate it? And does this totally kill the idea of the Shaw deal? Well, listen, uh, the priority number one today is restoring services. We'll get back to the competition aspect uh, at the appropriate time. You know, I've been very clear uh, from the get-go that I will not allow the wholesale transfer of licenses from Shaw to Rogers. And I think today is just another example. Like you say, we need diversity. We, know, we need reliability. We need quality networks because that's an example of how much Canadians depend on that. But I must say, Vashi, today... Uh, Everyone is focusing on restoring services because it's impacting millions of businesses, right. Canadians Res around the country. A and I can assure you that uh, and I, and I, I've been reaching out to all CEOs okay. to make sure that this is priority number one for everyone. And, and pardon the interruption, we're just running out of time. But I, I do want to make sure I ask on behalf of Canadians who really do feel like they're at the behest of these three companies, does your government have a plan to make sure there are more than three companies and something like this if it happens again doesn't affect millions and millions of canadians no they do not have a plan if they had a plan they would allow fucking foreign uh options like say fucking verizon or fucking other shit like that in, into the marketplace or allow or or, you know, fucking put restrictions on the, the fucking current, like, telecom company industries. It just won't happen. Like, 
liberals are okay with this. Just keep that in mind. Well, what I can assure is that we're going to investigate. We're going to get to the bottom of that to make sure that this does not happen again. And certainly, we will continue to foster competition, affordability. You know, we've been at it uh, from, from uh, the get-go. But today is another example yet of the fact that we need more diversity in terms of networks. Uh, but as you would appreciate, the priority today uh, is everyone working with international experts to get back online as quickly as possible to restore uh, the service that Canadian deserves. Minister, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your... Then why don't you... Why doesn't your party do shit about it then, bitch? Now John Lawford is the executive director and general counsel at the Public Interest... Access. Could Canada grow... Canada grow uh, could Canada grow be on the three big telecoms? As it stands right now, I don't think so. I... I honestly don't see it happening anytime soon. Unless, you know... There's a lot of fucking pushback from Canadians about, like, the fucking outage, the fucking expensive-ass fucking, um, fucking expensive-ass, like, telecom bills and, like, Canadians just getting fucking fed up with the monopoly that these three fucking companies have and like either buy out or snuff out the fucking competition because of how fucking big and big they are. Advocacy Center in Ottawa. Hi, John. So uh, can you tell us, uh, like, how did we get to this point? You know, where, where three companies control 90% of the wireless market, but you know, where even the smaller providers like, like Fido and Virgin and Kudo rely on the infrastructure of the big three. You, have you want to know the funny thing about the fucking infrastructure that the big three put in? And like, we'll we'll, get, we'll talk about like fi fucking Fido and Kudo. Um, the the irony in the fucking infrastructure about the uh, the infrastructure of fucking telecom. Uh, industry that's all fucking subsidized by the by the government and like they don't they just don't give a shit they're not gonna do anything about it because they're fucking lobbying so like do you really expect anything to come out of this outage like i expect fuck all to come out of it and like kudo is i think owned by telus and i think fido is owned by I think Rogers. So realistically, even those smaller fucking companies don't matter because they're they're just owned by the bigger company. It's just a more fucking cheaper option for fucking Canadians. Like if you're poor, you're going to be using Fido or Kudo or Virgin. So it doesn't really matter in the long run cuz it's still going to the same place. Like, it's so fucking stupid, man. Private companies that have been given a public infrastructure, a key one, your internet and your cell phone and even your home phone to run. And when you do that, the size and scale that you need to run a telco leads naturally to them getting larger and trying to push out competitors because they have a nice uh, return if they have a larger scale. So, um the government has chosen to run our telecom system this way and to rely on competition. And unfortunately, sometimes those companies, as I said, will do better and get bigger uh, as they get bigger. And that that leads to very few, very few competitors. And as, as you pointed out, there are some other names you mentioned, which are actually just uh, flanker brands of the larger companies. And yeah, like I had mentioned earlier, like Kudo is owned by fucking Telus and Fido is owned by Rogers, if I'm not mistaken. So it doesn't matter. Like, none of that shit matters. And plus, like, if a smaller, like, independent company that offers fucking uh, telecom services, usually better, if they're approached by, like, f say, fucking Rogers, for example, of course they're going to sell it uh, to, to Rogers. Because of course they're going to sell all that fucking data and shit. Like... Is anyone really surprised?
what needs to happen is there needs to be a gigantic fucking reg regulation dick just shoved up these corporations' asses. That's what needs to fucking happen. Like, they need to be regulated like fuck. Because th this shit just can't be happening. I'm getting sick of it. As well as, like, a whole bunch of other fucking Canadians, too. Can I ask you, I mean, just from the telco's point of view, the, you know, the argument that Canada is a big country. So, you know, you have the big three who have made big infrastructure investments up front so that, you know, the, the lack of competition is just a natural by Except that all that shit was subsidized by the government, so it doesn't even fucking matter. Like, it was subsidized by the conservatives and it's subsidized by the liberals. It doesn't fucking matter. They'll say that either way. Like, fucking every company that's subsidized by the government says that they have an investment in infrastructure if or like other fucking industries like it's so fucking idiotic like who the fuck cares what you know fucking the ceo of telus thinks like i don't give a shit what he says he's subsidized it, like all that fucking shit's subsidized by the government anyways so who the fuck cares Products of that does that argument hold up in your mind Canada is actually more densely populated than the United States. Uh, most of our population runs along the southern border and up certain um, channels, if you will, uh, like the road up between uh, Calgary and Edmonton. So we're, we're actually more concentrated and we have to cover less of the country. Now, there are pockets of Canada and, of course, rural Canadians that live all over the country. But it, most of the population is actually within pretty easy reach. So, yes, there's investment that's needed. Yeah, like... It, it it's literally like fucking Victoria Island, like pull up a map of Canada. So let's go here. Days after. So. It's all, like, most of Canada lives, like, over here, in this fucking area, which is Victoria Island, have some living over here, and, like, the rest is over here, you have Calgary here, you have Edmonton there, which, there's a little bit of people that live there, and then goes down here, you have Regina, and then, like, you have Winnipeg here, other big cities, Brandon here, as well as, like, you can go on over here, you have Kenora, keep going, and, like, densely populated over here, and then you have people over here, Quebec, Montreal, keep going, keep going, you have some people living here, and you have people living in St. John's. And then... In, in PEI. But, like, that's fucking PEI. That, can, that shit can take, like, a day to set up. <laughs> and then, like, in New Brunswick, in Nova Scotia. Like, that's realistically everywhere. And then, like, you have, like, a Caliwit, and then, like, a little company... Like, probably, like, a little fucking city here. And then Yellowknife and fucking Yukon. That's all that you have. Like, that's all that you have to cover. So all that infrastructure talk bullshit it is just a bunch of fucking lies. Like, it's so stupid, man. After millions of Canadians were cut off from their phones and the internet, the country's telecommunications regulator has a message for Rogers. It says last week's events jeopardized the safety of millions and called them unacceptable, demanding the Well, yeah, because, like, you couldn't fucking call 911. It was so stupid, man. ...details about what went wrong, setting a 10-day deadline. Well, it's going to come down to when we actually get to see the answers. Are those answers um, exactly the type of responses that we were, that we're looking for? After no. days of complaints, Rogers says customers will receive credit for five days of lost service instead of the two it initially proposed. Uh, it calls for clear compensation plans. I don't believe that at all. I, I, I don't believe that at all. 
at most they'll probably get like one day of compensation i would be surprised that they actually gave out and like our entire fucking work week for next time should the telecommunications company for outages look more like when it comes to compensation look more like the airline industry with some sort of bill of rights for users i think these are all things that need to be dis yes they should because if it's going to be three massive fucking companies we need at least a bare fucking minimum of regulatory uh power over them instead of letting them do whatever the fuck they want Disgust. when his internet was knocked out small business owner neil brody says he couldn't answer client emails for days with our industry we're constantly in contact not only with the clients to give them updates on how their particular projects are going but also with the suppliers and we were not able to contact anybody as a result of this yesterday the industry minister pushed the country's major like, I love the fact that, you know, fucking people are like, oh, the fucking businesses lost, lost money and shit. I'm like, I don't give a shit. I, I, I honestly don't give a shit about that. What I give a shit about is like, you know, fucking people like say dying from a fucking car accident or like someone's dying of an overdose and they can't fucking dial 911 because it's owned by Rogers and Rogers is down. Like, I don't give a shit about that. I'm sorry. I, I don't give about fucking... Jeff, who's runs a fucking, I don't know, fucking used car business, and he he fucking can't get a hold of like certain people or some shit. I don't give a shit about that. I'm sorry, I don't. I I I care more about those who are like actually fucking like who actually fucking suffered from it, not the fucking business owners that lost a little bit of fucking profit your telecom companies to come to an agreement on emergency backup plans should one of them go down again it's an easy fix that we should have a backup network something that actually can cater to the day-to-day -day, day needs like we shouldn't have to face this so we know these things can happen how come we we have not uh we are not well prepared for it does it cost money brother and that's just the way the fucking capitalist system like if you're going to fucking run that shit you're going to spend the least amount of money fucking possible so your fucking wealthy ass fucking executives and the ceo can make as uh, as much fucking money as they want that's why the crtc is asking lots of questions to rogers including what caused the outage and how many people could not call 911 and for how long the regulator also says it's considering a public inquiry Rafa Vigicani on CBC News, Ottawa. Shane E.B. says his father Greg and Aunt Linda... So yeah, uh, as you know, fucking people couldn't come nine, uh, call 911, so uh, they want to... They're, they're raising concerns about not being able to dial 911 because it's owned by fucking Rogers would often run errands together my father and my aunt they they go out together every week but on friday he says his aunt began to feel unwell in downtown hamilton his father didn't have a cell phone so he asked people in a nearby parking lot for help they couldn't connect to 911 so he went further the people he encountered on the street didn't have functioning cell phones and it, it you know, I, honestly, that's just when you f pull a fucking American and, you know, dr like fucking vroom vroom her to the hospital because you can't call a fucking ambulance. Like, it, it's fucking... Like, this is the shit that I was talking about, like, why it's bad for a fucking telecom company to own uh, access and exclusive rights to fucking services that everyone needs. It's fucking idiotic that they that they fucking own the rights to emergency services like why the fuck is that the case i can imagine that was really hard on him uh he you know caring for his sister and uh she needed help uh she was in distress um and he had to keep leaving her to try to get help an ambulance did arrive to take Evie's aunt to hospital, 
where she later died of a brain aneurysm. He says access to emergency services. Like uh, the one thing that that fucking pisses me off about uh, about this whole situation is like people fucking died because of this. Like no one should be fucking dying from this shit. There's no reason for it. should always be available. I imagine a lot of people are questioning whether that's actually available right now and how safe they might be. According to Rogers' terms of service, access to 911 may not function correctly or at all in the what? event of a network outage or power failure. And while there is a... That's kind of fucked up because, you know, that's a number you should be able to call regardless of this shit. It's... It's fucking stupid that, you know, oh, it's in our terms of service. If you can't dial 911, that's not our problem. The way to get around that on cell phones, not everyone is aware of it. Removing your SIM card, um, you're no longer a subscriber of any network. You don't have a phone number or anything like that. It still lets you uh, dial 911 anywhere. Some say that's critical information all Canadians should know in case of an emergency. Like, I did know about this, but, like, it's fucking idiotic that, you know, and, like, the thing is, is if you, like, take out your SIM card in some places, you can, and they find out that you can completely fucking void your contract, which is so stupid. Might be just a good public service announcement that the uh, Cellcom can share. Some experts say the government also has a role to play. It could be possible to mandate that the phone network um, must handle 911 calls even though if, if the rest of the network is down please emergencies some say it's an important life-saving service and telecom i mean of course you have fucking people dying of like heart attacks or brain aneurysms or fucking uh, car accidents that need f fucking help like now and like if they fucking can't access 911 because uh, fucking rogers is down like uh, they've got they've got blood on their hands i'm sorry it, it's it's so fucking stupid and it's just frustrating um companies need to understand the role they play in keeping people connected to it idol musa cbc news hamilton but like they don't just they just don't give a shit man they they'll just fucking wave their hands and be like oh it's not our problem It's infuriating. Lara Morgan's son fell at rugby practice Friday. She was told he may have a cervical spine issue and to call 911. I tried to call 911 and my phone wasn't working and it was quite terrifying. Calls to emergency services, interact payments and Wi-Fi on the Rogers network all were in chaos. This was no mere inconvenience. For more than 10 million people, it was a scramble to work, to make or receive payments and access urgent help. For the outage to happen on a day of Art Walk, that was really, really hard. A lot of us artists make sales through our Instagram stories and use that platform, and yeah, we couldn't use anything. So it was, it was rough. Shares of Rogers tumbled Monday along with consumer confidence, investors worrying about the Rogers-Shaw deal, and frustrations like, already the Rogers Shaw deal was, like, very fucking, like, iffy, but, like, if, if Rogers keeps having fucking problems with, like, connections, like, year after year, like, why the fuck are people still with them, honestly? Like, they're not fucking cheaper, any cheaper than any other of the fucking... Uh, telecom companies, their services are roughly around the same, so it doesn't even fucking matter. Like, it, it doesn't matter which fucking service you go with. Or which telecom company you go with, they're all the fucking same. It just doesn't matter, because service is going to be dog shit wherever you go. In Canada, and with whoever, because, you know, we don't want to fucking invest infrastructure or into the infrastructure for that and make a fucking public option. Even if it is dog shit. So, I honestly don't even know.
I don't know if I can say or do any more with this. Like, this, this is just really annoying. Rising over the second widespread Rogers outage in two years. Rogers is offering compensation to customers in the form of a credit that will automatically appear on their next bill for two days of lost service. And if it doesn't make the cutoff for... No, it's five days now, remember? They're... They're just, you know... They don't fucking care. Gonna, I, I would be surprised if it, it is actually five. I'd be surprised if it was two. For that, uh, for so oh, here's the fucking, here's the fucking lunatic man himself. Some customers, although we expect to have all customers done by then, it will be on the following month's bill. Small business advocates say. The funny thing is, is that it's probably gonna take them at least like fucking three months before this, and then people are gonna get fucking annoyed with Rogers. And then they're going to swap over to, like, I don't know, fucking Kudo or some shit. Like, it doesn't fucking matter. It's going to take forever for them to actually, like, do something about it as well as, like, people are just going to be frustrated with it because they're going to be like, oh, I get, like, two to five days of fucking credit on my fucking next bill. Like, they're going to be... It's gonna take them a lot longer than they think, than the CEO thinks it is, because like they've Rogers has been cut, fucking cutting, uh, fucking workers as well. So I'm honest, like, of course it's gonna take longer. Hey, that won't cut it. At minimum, I would hope that Rogers would would deduct an entire month of service uh, for all of the different utilities that were affected by the outage. Our bills are expensive. Like I think my bill probably is two hundred and seventy five dollars a month. Um, I spend on my... The fuck? 270? Bro, that's insane. Like, uh, like I'm with Telus, and I spend, like, fucking 70, 80 bucks on my fucking phone bill alone. So I can't imagine paying, like, $275 for shitty internet, fucking shitty cell service, and probably shitty, like, satellite, too. I my phone bill and maybe it's more maybe close to 300 so five to ten dollars off it's kind of like make a difference man do something you know it's like a drop in the bucket a class action suit with what, what they should do is what, what what i think rogers should do is i think that they should waive all of all their fucking consumers bills for that month because of this it caused a lot of fucking unnecessary death because people couldn't dial emergency services it caused a whole bunch of fucking like if you want to take the even the fucking business route it caused a lot of fucking businesses to lose money it caused a lot of fucking a whole bunch of like other shit as well like it's that's what they should be doing they should you should just waive this fucking month off of every fucking con one of their customers' bills. Because fucking Lord knows that the CEO makes a fuck ton of money and he could easily do that. But he's not going to. What he's going to end up doing is he's going to end up fucking just giving them like $10 off of their next fucking phone bill or whatever the fuck. Was filed on Which isn't even going to make a big difference to be honest half of all Rogers, Fido, or Chatter customers in Quebec, or anyone in the province affected by the outage. And the Public Interest Advocacy Centre filed a letter with the CRTC, the industry regulator, Friday, demanding an inquiry into the outage, calling for a look at whether all telecom providers in Canada should be required to meet a baseline of emergency planning and ref- They should. They honestly should. They should all be required to meet a, a fucking- the bare minimum having fucking emergency service uh available like 24 7 even if there is a fucking outage like this you know and if something does go down like like this happens they should be for fucking forced to pay that, that's like it's fucking stupid refund requirements and what happened on friday is unacceptable and we're committed to taking every step within our control to ensure it doesn't happen again consumer bitch you said that last time and it didn't fucking happen so i don't want to fucking hear it from you shut your fucking ceo mouth up
Advocates say because the big three, Bell, Rogers and TELUS, control about 90% of the market, a potential Shaw Rogers deal could make things even worse for customers. One company's tech problems should not lead to a national economic problem for the entire country. Frustrated customers. I have a feeling that the only reason why this fucking happened is either due to like a system update that like that happened last time that uh you know you were able to fucking you weren't able to fucking access shit like that happened last time or they were trying to fucking cut corners somewhere that's most likely what it was it was one of those two convent to their member of parliament call the company and ask for rogers loyalty specialists and supervisors and if they're still unhappy consider switching to smaller independent providers and Gaviola. But like the fucking small independent dividers, like they can only do so much. Like it doesn't matter. Like you have three fucking companies and that's it. And then like you have your fucking poor options for those companies. Uh, fucking Telus, uh, or not Telus, fuck, Fido, Kudo, and Virgin. So it doesn't matter. Global News, Toronto. That Hassan face, though. Roller coaster loops aren't circular. Interesting. Ottawa's response to the Rogers network outage that impacted more than. So I'm kind of curious to see what fucking Ottawa has to say. Uh, it's from what I understand, the what they're doing now is like more or less a fucking band-aid and it's gonna happen again because what happens with fucking band-aids they come off and that fucking wound is still there 12 million people follows the wisdom of not putting all your eggs in the same basket this was uh, unacceptable full stop by creating a safety net that doesn't put the onus on a single carrier putting our proverbial telecom eggs in multiple baskets a formal agreement is due within 60 days from the seven biggest telecoms. The contingency plan must cover emergency roaming and mutual assistance, outlining how companies will work together to keep access to emergency services going, plus a formal protocol for communicating with authorities and the public. This is very much inspired about what the uh, United States just implemented uh, in terms of network resilience in case of disaster, but it goes well beyond. The big three, Bell, Telus and Rogers, together control 90% of the market, and they've all told Global News they're on board. But some analysts question this approach, saying... This they, I would, for one, be very surprised if they actually do fucking implement this, as well as, like, if the fucking telecom companies are actually on board, because they don't want to fucking work together, unless it's, like, fucking price-fixing. Or, sorry, price leadership. Like, it, it doesn't fucking matter. Like, we're going to get fucked either way when it comes to telecoms, so. This is the second major Rogers outage in 15 months. Rogers has to, is basically the weak uh, player in the three because their network is antiquated. It's obviously flawed. There are issues that make it uh, um, problematic and dysfunctional. Allowing Rogers to get help from others doesn't address potential issues within its systems and raises a host of legal issues. As for questions about why this happened, this is the explanation from Rogers' CEO. We had a network maintenance upgrade that was put in place that had an error in it. Oh, so it was exactly like what happened last time. I'm not surprised at all because the fucking CEO is a dumbass and he wants to try and cut corners and fucking uh, squeeze as much fucking surplus labor value out of his fucking workers and the fucking uh consumers that he can so i'm not fucking surprised by this fucking jill biden looking ass motherfucker and that error caused our equipment to fail and that caused an overload of data within our core network and caused it to shut down the CRTC, which regulates the industry, is conducting its own investigation into the root cause of the outage. Rogers has until next Friday to respond to questions in greater detail. With Canada rolling out its 5G networks, the next generation of internet, this tech expert says it's critical to ensure there's a plan to prevent and manage emergency disruptions. 
5G will mean more reliance on broadband cellular networks than ever before. At some point, we are going to have homes that are far more connected. You know, lights are connected, our dishwasher could be connected. That scope could... Yes, that's totally something that I fucking want the telecom companies access to. As well as, you know, fucking... I, I don't understand why all that has to be fucking connected to the internet. I don't give it... Like, I just want to fucking like, put my dishes into the dishwasher and not have to worry, like... Not have to fucking open an app to open or to fucking turn it on. Like, it's so fucking stupid. At that point, I just would rather wash it by my, my fucking hand. It would just be a giant fucking waste of money. At that point. The fucking telecom companies can kiss my ass. Get a lot larger. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Cowboy beans. Sounds pretty good. This after Roe v. Wade. Did we watch that? I think so. We begin with widespread outages within the Rogers network that are affecting everything from cell service to 911 calls. Our Kayla McLean joins us now with more details on this. So good afternoon, Kayla. What more have you discovered? Well, they say you never know what you have until it's gone, and that was the reality for many waking up this morning to realize they couldn't call or text or even surf the internet. Now, Rogers users in the GTA and across Canada facing a mass outage this morning with both cellular and internet services impacted. According to their website, the company began experiencing issues around 4.40 a.m. this morning. However, Rogers didn't officially acknowledge the issue on Twitter until just before 9 a.m. posting this statement. Promising customers that they are working to oh resolve the issue. Missing from the statement, no information on why the outage is happening and when services will be back up again. Meanwhile, uh, uh, outage reports have been piling up on Rogers' uh, webpage with more than 17,000 users submitting complaints in Toronto alone and hundreds more from provinces coast to coast. Toronto and Peel Police both acknowledging the issue on Twitter, noting some may be struggling to make 911 calls. Go Transit, Bike Share, Interact, and Hydro One all acknowledging their services have also been impacted. Now, of course, Twitter has been flooded with reaction from disgruntled users. One person posting this pic of people huddled around a Toronto Starbucks to use its Wi-Fi, which runs on Bell. Uh, Here's what Toronto Mayor John Tory had to say about this outage and some reaction from some frustrated customers. One of the challenges they have, obviously, is if they need to, to, to get back to somebody who has a Rogers phone, who may be in an emergency circumstance, that is challenging because the phones of those people aren't working. But as for the 911 operations center itself, um, it is working fine. We're back to the olden days um, where everything runs on cash and you have no contact with anyone. You can't call or text anyone. I'm sure people are losing a lot of money today. Um, but it's, it's a reality check or a time to, you know, connect with your family members or whoever is close to you. And I think it's critical for everybody, especially in this day and age of work. So we rely on it quite a lot. It's, ju it's just frustrating. We're so used to reaching for our phones and, you know, just checking what the news and what ne uh, weather and things like that. So it's frustrating. Now, it's not the first time this has happened. You might remember, Miranda, April of last year, Rogers experienced a countrywide outage similar to this one. And that one lasted from 2 a.m. to 8 p.m. Well, well Kayla, I, I do remember because I am actually a Rogers customer. I hope you're not. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Kayla. That's our Kayla McLean reporting in the newsroom. <sighs> Thank you. For hey, let's watch the fucking uh, response that the fucking dumbass CEO of Rogers has to say. Like, we already watched bits and pieces of it, but I think this is an un un uninterrupted fucking one. For allowing us the opportunity to speak with you. So, of course, the big question, are all services back now across the country? They are. Um, before right. I get to that, let me... If no, you this me is a different one. I want to, again apologize to Canadians and to our customers for the network outage that they experienced yesterday. We know how important networks are um, to our customers. 
and to Canadians and the role they play. And we take that responsibility very seriously. I'm pleased to report that as of now, pretty close to 100% of our network is now back up and running. 100% of our wireless customers have service across the nation. And in terms of our cable, both home and business, less than 1% are still having what we would describe as intermittent issues, but our teams are on it and we hope to resolve that within the hour so that- It had to be probably fucking larger than 1%. It probably closer to like 5%. It's just a fucking liar, like all CEOs are. Um, very shortly, we'll be at 100% for all our services. Do we know exactly what caused this? We're still going through, as you would expect, a very, what I would call uh, a very detailed and rigorous review process. It was a fucking update. It was an update to the server, to the servers that fucked everyone over like last time. Uh, we'll be going a little bit more into detail into it after we watch all these fucking videos. So root cause analysis to make sure we completely understand how this happened so we can prevent it going forward. And in the coming hours and days, we'll be very transparent and share uh, with everyone uh, what we find. And more importantly, that this is not gonna be a concern going forward. What I can share uh, with everyone as of right now. Bitch, you said la that last time. It doesn't fucking matter. You're, you're... Just fucking lying between your teeth. Said that last time and it doesn't fucking matter. Now, uh, we've narrowed the cause to a network system failure following a maintenance update that we did late Thursday evening, early Friday morning. And these are typically very routine updates in our core network. That update caused some of the routers in our system to malfunction. And that malfunction caused traffic overload and as a result of that, the whole system just shuts down and the network be became inoperable uh, to our customers. And so what we've done, we immediately, as soon as we knew what the uh, problem was, we replaced the equipment, the software, the configuration that we needed to in order to get our network up and running. And we worked through that uh, all of yesterday and through the night uh, to make those changes uh, so we can move quickly as possible to get the, uh, as I said, to get the, the network up. As part of the due diligence uh, review root cause analysis process, you can expect us to comb through various pieces of data. I can tell you that our routers, as well as other pieces of equipment in the network have very detailed logs so that we're going through and it captures it millisecond by millisecond. So we have hundreds, if not thousands of people within our organization, technicians, experts um, within Rogers, as well as with our global suppliers, um, their best talent from around the world. And they've been on this since 5 a.m. yesterday, trying to work through this. And as they go through the root cause, they'll review those call logs. Don't fucking lie. You said you only acknowledged it on fucking nine. Fine piece of shit. Um, or I should say, um, um, logs on the uh, equipment to make sure we fully understand millisecond by millisecond what happened and so that we have uh, we are sure that we have the right fix and prevent this from happening going forward i know you've talked about and you said it you've talked about pre prevention but this isn't the first time this has happened it's happened before so why is there no redundancy in place for such outages to prevent something like this from happening again Absolutely. As we move forward, we're very focused on resiliency and redundancy of our network. And we continue and our plan moving forward is not only to fix some of the process items related to this, but continue and ramp up the investments we're making into our networks to ensure that redundancy and resiliency that you just mentioned. Well, you saw, you know, what, what the overall reaction was. It exposed our, of course, our reliance on technology. We saw chaotic scenes, people unable to do their banking or get their groceries, even to get gas. Um, so consumers certainly feeling the pinch, but businesses as well lost quite a bit of money, many of them having to turn people away because they couldn't process those transactions. What are you going to do for them? Nothing. I had the opportunity to speak to... Uh, few of our customers, I'm trying to speak to as many as I can, 
And I can tell you through those firsthand conversations. A fucking CEO responds. No, he probably just fucking strolled through Twitter, saw the fucking hashtag, clicked on the hashtag, and saw that a lot of fucking people were pissed off at him. Because, you know, he, he thinks he knows what he's doing. And he's like, no, just fucking cut corners, bitch. Shut your, shut your ass. Shut your mouth. Um, I'm tired, how man. How <laughs> and challenging uh, we made things for them. And for that, again, I am, together with all of Rogers, truly sorry uh, for causing this. And we're going to fix this going forward in terms of um, what are we doing specifically for those customers. There's really two things. We are proactively applying bill credits uh, for those customers. But more importantly, we're making sure that we're putting the money back into and investing in the things they need to make sure that they have that resiliency and redundancy in the network so that they can rely and we can earn their trust again on the Rogers network. Tony Staffieri, president and CEO of Rogers Community. There's no fucking way that fucking Tony talks about it. On these nationwide wide outages, we reached Kai Prague in Brampton. He is a senior vice president at Rogers. We'll get to what happened in a moment, but I think the first thing that everyone is going to want to know is when will this be fixed? Bro, this guy has no idea how to fucking green screen. Or use fucking overlays. God. I fucking hate these kind of people, man. Okay, so as of now, we, we do not have... Any it's like the shitty fucking gamer mic, too. Like, what is this? Like, fucking... Uh, 2011? Like, come on, my guy. Even my fucking dumbass has, like, a, an actual proper mic and actual proper fucking headphones. An ETA on when the, uh, when the problem will be fixed? Can you say that it will be today like are we talking hours days yeah so so where we are right now we are um we're we're investigating the the root cause of the uh, of the failure that's impacted our customers coast to coast um we're getting very close to understanding the root cause of the of the failure and we're taking actions along with our network vendors to recover the situation but i do not have an eta at the moment See, I just, I, I do just want to be crystal clear. I, I can tell you're having a difficult day, Mr. Prague, and I'm not trying to belabor the point, but this won't necessarily be fixed today. This could be a situation that goes on for days. We are, we are working very, very hard on this. Um, as I said, we haven't identified the root cause yet. We do see some signs, some good signs of, of the actions that we're taking, uh, making a difference in terms of bringing the network systems I don't know why you can't just say yes, it could take a couple days to get this shit back on. Like... Stop fucking sidestepping, my guy. Back online again. But we do not yet have an ETA uh, for, full, uh, for full recovery of the, of the networks. Um, I wouldn't like to say whether it's going to be uh, fully online today or not. Um, but we are working very, very hard on, on making sure that we get everything running as soon as possible. I appreciate that you don't know the specifics of the root cause, and, and, and frankly, I don't want to get too technical here, but can you say whether it was, for instance, a cyber attack or whether this is an internal problem? Uh, we, we, we don't have a root cause yet. Uh, we are focused very, very hard on obviously understanding that root cause and re restoring service for our customers. Um, obviously, as soon as we restore the service, we will then start to understand, uh, obviously, in depth, the root cause of this. Um, so I wouldn't like to speculate, to be honest, and it's too early to speculate. Okay. How many people have lost internet or phone access today? How many people are affected? Uh, millions of our customers, coast to coast, are, are impacted on our wireless network as well as our wireline networks, um, as well as our enterprise customers. So um, it's obviously quite a big, a big impact to our, our customers, coast to coast. Do you, can you say how many millions of people? I can just tell you millions of customers are impacted. Okay. Th those people who are impacted are, I'm sure, wondering how this could happen. I appreciate you just told me you don't know the root cause. They may be asking, though, like, obviously, you are a massive telecom network. Why were there not enough fail-safes in place to prevent something on this scale? 
So the network is, is built um, in a way, um, including multiple levels of redundancy across the, across the networks. Um, and so, as I, as I said before, we, we don't yet understand the root cause of, of why this has happened. We don't understand how the, uh, the, the, the different levels of redundancy that we build across the network coast to coast have not, um, have not worked. Um, and so, you know, as I, as I said before, we, we, um, we're working very, very hard on, on getting to that root cause and, and recovering. This is an incredibly frustrating day for you. I, I, I think it's an, a frustrating interview as well. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't uh, go into into to, to more detail around that. I just doesn't want to fucking go be transparent about it. Like, I'm pretty sure, like, it's come out the eighth. I'm pretty sure he fucking knew what the problems were. He just didn't want to fucking state what it was. I, I, you know, personally understand how frustrating this is for our customers across the country um, that, that they have not been able to use uh, use these services and I can assure you that we are working very very hard here in our um, we're in here in our network operation center um, our engineers are on sites uh, all across the country working very very hard to restore services so as soon as we can <laughs> we will uh, we will have things running again uh, I'm sure there are a lot of folks cheering you on in the sense that they, they do want you to have success with that. I, I do have to ask you... Yeah. That a, a bunch of fucking bootlickers are going to be cheering him on. That's really... It's going to be cheering him on. Like... That's the only people that would actually fucking care. So, um, you know, this is a frustration for some people. It is more than a frustration for others, from what we understand. There are questions about people, even though 911 is still operational, who have Roger cell phones and aren't able to access 911. From what I understand, that that's not supposed to be the case. Aren't you supposed to ensure that cell phones can access 911 even when they don't have service? Um, so there, there are some impacts to, to 911 calls um, on the network. Um, and as we recover the network, uh, we are prioritizing the mobile part of the network. So we get that part of the network up and running as soon as possible. So that, that is our priority to restore those services and other blue night blue light services across the country. Um, okay, I, 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 I need to, I'm being called into the uh, into our incident room here. So um, I, I need to, uh, I need to head off. I hope I've he answer. just wants to avoid fucking hard questions. He, he, that's why he's fucking doing that. Oh, I need to be fucking uh, out of out of here. So I be called into the incident room. To all of your questions. Uh, well, I, I, the last thing I'll ask you, yeah. sir, is just you know I, I know you're still trying to fix this, but can you promise people that you guys are going to get this under control? This isn't going to happen again because you know that there are customers who are going to walk away after today. Absolutely. Um, all of our focus is on getting this up and running as, as quickly as possible. We want, uh, we want nothing more than that. You, I know it's a very stressful day for okay. you, Mr. Prig. I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Now to hear from the government, we have reached Greg Fergus. He's the Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister and to the President of the Treasury Board. Hi there, uh, Greg Fergus. You just heard that interview. I know you yourself are affected by this outage. What did you think about the answers? Uh, <laughs> I think I see you laughing there. What do you think about the answers that well, Rogers had well, to provide? Well, I, I'm just happy to be able to join this interview because, like millions of Canadians, uh, my system is down. My company uses, uh, my provider uses uh, Rogers as a backup. I'm in Halifax today, uh, so that's their provider when I'm in Atlantic Canada. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm boring somebody's Wi-Fi to be able to participate on this uh, on this telephone call, on this uh, video call. Um, you know, it, it goes from the mildly, mildly uh, inconvenient to the you know the serious issues of not having access to 911 uh, businesses not having access is access to uh, to interact um, all today you know using cash which is when's the last time you've done that um, so it, it has been a really tough day. Well, so I want to know what you think then when you hear this Rogers executive saying not only do they not quite know what's wrong they also can't say that it's going to be fixed today. Yeah, look, I can imagine that they are just, you know, doing everything possible to get things up and running. It, I mean, there's no profit in uh, not providing a service that has become to us like air that, that we breathe. We just Of course there's fucking profit to be made there. What the fuck are you saying? There's always profit to be made off of this. Off of this shit. Like, they're most likely just gonna fucking upcharge later. Being like, you owe us this 
amount of fucking money that we provided you in credits. People are going to be like, well, where the fuck is this extra service charge coming from? Of course that they're going to fucking profit off. Don't realize it's around us. Um, we use uh, a mobile services and data services. So, uh, you know, it's part of our lives now. It's fully integrated. So I can imagine uh, they're under a lot of pressure. Um, but it's really important that they communicate clearly with their customers and to let us know, uh, you know, when we should expect things to come back online so that we can adjust our lives accordingly. But like, he avoided the question, though, to that question. He avoided that fucking question. He didn't want to fucking answer it because he knew for a fact that it was going to be a long time and it was just going to piss off people. Like, have more fucking people just leave. Follow it, continue. Uh, I also asked the Rogers executive, Mr. Prig, about the cause and whether we could rule out the idea that this was a cyber attack. He wasn't willing to say. From the government perspective, I'm sure Canadians would like to know uh, whether this is uh, something that's malicious or just sort of a failure of the system. Is there anything the government can say about that? Well, look, uh, what we can what we can say is that according at this time, according to the Canadian security establishment and their analysis shows that uh, this is not a cyber attack, um, but this is early going. Um, you know, if it's more sophisticated the attack, I guess the trickier would be able to see it. But at this point, I think we can reassure Canadians uh, that it's not a cyber attack. Uh, I know Bill Blair has tweeted out that the, the government is monitoring the impacts of this. Um, you, you talked about some of them a moment ago, but I want to dig on, on one in particular, which is this question of 911 and some people's phones not having access to the service, even though the service itself is working. We're hearing about cities like Toronto, Vancouver, Fredericton, Winnipeg. Isn't that not supposed to be the case? Is, is there not a commitment that telecommunications companies make to ensure that even if service isn't available, that their phones are still supposed to be able to access 911? Precisely. It's, it's part of their uh, whole process and their licensing process that they, produ they produce a whole bunch of robust systems, fail-safe systems, to ensure that these services can always be provided. We seem to have just hit that one time in a... I'm assuming a million, um, where uh, the, the fail-safes uh, failed. Uh, so there's going to have to be a lot of uh, investigation uh, as to, or not investigation, but I'm certain there's going to be a lot of discussions as, as with Rogers as to how this happened and how to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You know, sometimes, well, you know, these, these start, go ahead. Well, I, I, you seem to be saying, like, it's unfortunate, but it happens. But I guess what we don't know right now, Greg Ferguson, and I'm certainly not trying to be alarmist about this, but if people can't access 911, like, th this could be, a, this could put someone's safety, their, their life even, exactly. in, in jeopardy. And, like, it did, though. It did all across the country. And, like, the fuckers at the top are going to be able to get away with it. So it, it ultimately doesn't matter. Like, you know, you had, you had fucking people die because of this shit. Like that one fucking lady that had a brain hemorrhage. Wasn't able to get to the fucking hospital because no one had access to fucking 911. As well as like, you know, that one other fucking, that, that one, that one lady's son who could be fucking permanently paralyzed because of this shit. Like, it's fucking sad and infuriating at the same time. So is there action that the government is going to take, given that telecom communications, uh, telecom companies are supposed to be doing this, is there not some sort of follow-up or, or consequence for them? No. Well, certainly there's going to be a lot. I'm certain that there are, and I'm not going to... I'm not familiar with the precise details of how it works when these kind of situations do happen. But I do know that uh, a bunch of robust systems had been planned and built into the infrastructure. We want to make sure that Canadians have a, a system that they can rely upon. And, you know, by and large... But, like, no one can fucking rely on uh, on the fucking telecom companies, though. They, over, they overcharge for shit services as well as, like... When they do fuck up horrendously like this, there's no fucking, um, like, responsibility taken on by them. There's no fucking, uh, the government just does inact, or takes inaction when it comes to important issues like this. So it, it, they're not going to be fucking 
at most they'll probably just get a fucking slap on the wrist, which seems like it happened. Uh, you know, today notwithstanding, it has worked. Uh, so there has to be a real take good look to take a look at what failed and how do we make sure that systems can handle that and perhaps new ways of looking at making sure that these systems hold up. I want to uh, talk to you about something that NDP leader Jagmeet Singh tweeted today, uh, mm -hmm. because it's not just a criticism of the telecoms, it's a, t a criticism, frankly, of your government. He says that the outage highlights the dangers of a monopolized industry and says that these are, quote, the consequences of a liberal government that is fixated on protecting the profits of telecom giants. The liberals have previously promised to improve... I mean, he's literally right about that, though. Like, it, it, it's a fucking monopoly. The fucking telecom companies are paying off the fucking libs and probably the fucking conservatives too let's be real and uh you know they just want to fucking protect their fucking profits because you know they're fucking lobbying them so he's 100 percent right about that prove telecommunication service in this country by increasing competition so what does your government have to show on that front at this point Look, the government has always been uh, taking a look at the allocation of, of spectrum, which is what these companies use. And we want to make sure that there is, Canada has a more competitive market. We want to make sure that Canada has a more affordable market so that Canadians uh, can get... Bro, we literally pay the fucking highest for cell bills when it comes to, like, in the world. Like, we pay the highest when it comes to fucking cell and internet. It's all because of the uh, of a lack of competition and fucking mergers between giant companies, so that they can monopolize the fucking telecom company or telecom market even more. Like, uh, that's it, it. Doesn't fucking matter. Like, if we, like, even if we opened up like so fucking American brands, like Virgin Wireless, fucking, uh other fucking companies like that like it would help drive down fucking costs for for this shit uh, uh access to data and mobile services as cheaply as as they are in other countries and we also uh, certainly today raises it we want to make sure that it's a reliable yeah and like one thing like outside of the states like one thing that a lot of these other fucking countries do is they ha heavily regu regulate it so that this shit you know like doesn't happen as like if you need to call 911 you're able to as or like whatever their emergency service number is and like as well as like they have to like they're like heavily regulated in the form of like how much they're allowed to fucking charge people like even fucking dumbass Boris Johnson does that shit, man? Viable network. So uh, I don't think this is a time for you know, uh, frankly, uh, a, a political uh, drive-by here. Uh, the Wait, what? Politics does play a fucking role in this, though. Like, if you're not gonna fucking do anything about it, like, just say you're not gonna do anything about it. Wait, my fucking guy. Like, this is one hundred percent a political issue. But since the fucking liberals want to take inaction when it comes to, like, literally fucking anything outside of, like, indigenous people fucking protesting, like, it, it doesn't fucking matter. Because you rich fucks are just, or you're, you rich fucks are making money off of this. This is really a but, time but is he wrong? making sure that we have it. I mean, you're saying it's a drive-by, but is he wrong that there's not too much concentration given we don't even, I mean, we don't even know how many millions of people are without service. Does that not kind of right. prove the point that there is, that there is too much concentration right now? Well, we also, we also believe that there's too much concentration and this is a reason why when we're allocating spectrum, we want to make sure that we have a more uh, competitive market, which means more and new entrants coming into the system. So uh, I'm, I'm not certain what kind of magic wand he would like us to, uh, to, 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 to raise, uh, to... You wanna know which fucking magic wand to raise, bitch? Raise your fucking regulatory wand. Don't fucking pussy out of it. And, like, put your fucking foot down when it comes to telecom companies being like, 
No, you have to have at the bare minimum this shit available at all times, even if there is an outage, as well as you're only allowed to charge this amount of fucking money. It's not hard. Be a big boy, fucking regulate the shit that you get you guys were elected into for. Like and implement the shit that you say you're gonna do. Don't try and just fucking hand wave this off like like the fucking conservatives. Even though like liberals are just fucking less bigoted conservatives. Be able to solve this issue. Well, you've been, I mean, sir, you've, you've been, more. respectfully, right. you've been in government for, for years now. I don't think, you know, it, it, right. getting it done in seven years wouldn't be a magic wand, right? No, but there's been some, I mean, for example, I use, not Rogers, not Bell, but I used a, a smaller company, a Fizz, uh, which uses, it's piggybacks on the network of one of the companies, and they provide me with a much cheaper uh, uh, mobile access and data access, and, and millions of Canadians are like me, and they use these companies like Fizz uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to be able to access uh, the internet. And but that's not even true, like, no one's going to use fucking Fizz. Because, like, their, their services are probably dog shit. Like, more dog shit than the big three. As well as, like, sometimes, you know, they don't have access to smaller fucking companies, you clown. What, ha what has to fucking happen is, like, yes, competition is a thing, but, like, regulatory action has to be taken. And, like, now is the f perfect fucking time to do it. But you guys just want to fucking sit on your asses, raking a shit ton of money, and just say you're going to do shit, but never end up doing anything. To have uh, mobile services, that makes a big difference. My uh, uh... And like, I'll use, I'll use where I live for an example. Since I live out in like, the fucking boonies and shit, I have, I used to have access to like, one option. And that was fucking Bell. And then later on, they there was a little bit of a growth in the area, so Rogers and Tells came in. So sometimes, like that's the only option that they have. So it's not on it's not on the fucking per, uh, person's fault who's living there. It's not their fault because of your guys's inaction and the fucking profiteering that goes on from the fucking telecom companies costs have gone down as have millions of canadians costs have gone down no they have not they have went up you fucking moron how is this guy in any fucking position of prominence like costs have not gone down they have actually went up a decent amount and like that's just across the board though like it doesn't fucking matter your dumbass is gonna say that oh no it went down because you probably fucking made more money and like whatever how much ever it was beforehand is like fucking chump change to you now so it doesn't matter for having access to these services so that's a kind of environment that we're trying to encourage and to making sure that continue to exist but i guess the flip side of it is that you, you, you don't have internet access today either and anyway greg fergus i think it is clear uh, to everyone listening uh and in this discussion that there is more to do on that front we thank you for taking the time to talk to us about it today it's a pleasure to join you and good luck everyone appreciate it all right let's move on to uh what actually fucking happened so, let's click. So the CRTC or uh, is ordering Rogers to explain in detail what caused the massive network outage. Uh, Rogers has yet to explain the cause of the outage. Uh, the Canadian broad, uh, Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecoms uh, Commission, the CRTC, is ordering Rogers to explain in detail what caused last week's uh, network outage, uh, how it affected emergency services, and what the company plans to do to compensate customers. 
So we've already talked about it a little bit. They said that they're going to be fucking uh, uh, transferring over like some social fucking credit for like two days. And then, you know, people got pissed off, but it was like only two days. So they bumped it up to five days. whoop de fucking do um, In a letter addressed to Todd Woodhead, Rogers Senior Vice President uh, of Regulatory Affairs, the CRTC, uh, Chids Rogers uh, for not being fully transparent with its customers. Hmm, the CEO said he was going to be fucking transparent. Guess what? He lied. Said he was going to be fully transparent, but he fucking lied. What else is new? Uh, in the first of several hours of the outage, it became clear that Rogers was either unable to uh, reassure or re-effective uh, reassuring uh, its customers providing and providing critical information about what uh, to expect. The letter reads, Rogers has yet to explain in detail what caused the outage. The CEO of the company, uh, Tony Stafford, or Stafford, uh, St Stafford released uh, statements Saturday uh, blaming a network system failure following a maintenance update. He didn't provide further detail. Of course, he wouldn't. Uh, Rogers to uh, customers five days of service for outage. Uh, no guarantee of public investigation into Rogers' outage, uh, despite calls from experts. Ottawa calls on telecom companies to shore up networks after Rogers' outages. It's not going to fucking happen. The only thing that might happen is this, but I don't think it'll be five days. Uh, these The CRTC lists uh, dozens of questions it wants from Rogers. It wants Rogers to answer, among other things. It wants uh, Rogers to explain the root cause of the outage and how they plan to honor uh, Staffery's promise to uh, proactively cr uh, credit customers' accounts. The thing with that, for the credits, is that it could take up to, like, say, fucking half a year. Why is that? Because they don't give a shit about their customers. They only give a shit about how much money they're going to make. Uh, the outage left some customers unable to call 911 despite rules in place meant to ensure that cell phones are, cap are able to contact emergency numbers even when they don't have service. The CRTC is asking Rogers to report how many 911 calls could not be completed during the outage the company has yet to uh, has until july 22nd to respond to the crtc's questions the letter says on monday uh, industry minister uh, francois philippe champagne uh, convened a meeting of telecom ceos including staffery to develop a plan to uh, uh, to, to blunt the impact of future outages on customers. I wanted to make sh I wanted to make sure that in no uncertain terms they understand how Canadians found the situation unacceptable and they need to take immediate inherent uh, initial steps to improve the resiliency of our network in Canada. Champagne told reporters after the meeting. The CRTC letter says that a number of customers have uh, contract, uh, contacted the commissions to complain, and some have even asked for a public inquiry. The letter did not rule out a full inquir inquiry, but said uh, the company provided answers should be an initial step. Which, you know, it should be, but they haven't even fucking done that yet so i'm not i'd be surprised if we got one at this point uh technology anal uh, analyst rashid uh said 
that the CRTC asking for answers is a good start, but what follows depends on Roger's response. It's going to come down to when we start when we see the answers, they will be uh, they will be the kind of answers we're looking for. Uh, will they be the kind of answers we're looking for? Uh, uh, task said. Yukasai, a lawyer with the public uh, interest adversary group, said that the CRTC's push for accountability may not go far enough, and that the public inquiry is the only way for customers and the public to weigh in on their concerns. Which, you know, is technically right about that. Uh, it's really unclear what's going to happen, uh, including when the public can uh, expect to see uh, recommendations from the CRTC or whether there will be a form of public input, as I said. Roger's outage, uh, outage points to a greater oversight of critical industry. Uh, Roger's shows uh, you have a plan B when wireless internet service fails, uh, analyst said. Regardless of, uh, regardless of what comes out of the Rogers response to, uh, to the CRTC, Canada needs to be working on way to per ways to prevent uh, such outages in the future, uh, said Carleton University computer, computer engineering professor uh Ram Rami Gohari. It's an easy fix that should have a backup network, uh something that actually can charter can uh, charter to the day to day needs. We should shouldn't have to face this, Gohari said. We know these things can be, we know these things can happen. How come we are not well prepared for it? Are we not well prepared for it? Uh, Peter Nowak, uh, a vice president with uh, internet provider uh, Tukoski V said that the government and the CRTC need to push for more compensation or more competition in the telecoms industry uh, in many other countries if one provider goes down they don't all they don't take the whole country with them Nowak said Roger uh, Rogers outage is uh, Rogers outage also affected Smaller companies that rely on the, its network, including uh, TexLV, uh, Nowox, and said Tex, uh, TexLV said in uh, talks with Rogers to ensure that their customer will not be will, will be compensated as well. So I can't really say that I'm surprised at this shit, like. I I would honestly be surprised if we got uh, a fucking response, like a transparent response at uh, on July twenty second. I would be genuinely surprised, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. So let's move on to um conservative shit. We are also tracking the latest developments in the Conservative Party leadership race in this country, including new details about the disqualification of candidate Patrick Brown. A woman says she was the whistleblower in the initial complaint, and she's come forward with a new allegation. CBC's Nick Boisvert is on this story for us in Ottawa. So, Nick, tell us more about what we're hearing from this woman. 
Yeah, we're actually hearing some details finally about uh, what these alleged financial irregularities were that led to Patrick Brown being disqualified from the conservative leadership race. So they're coming from a whistleblower, a long time. Honestly, I could have seen this coming from a mile away. Like, it's not surprising in the slightest. Patrick Brown was pretty dog shit. I mean, like, all the fucking conservatives are dog shit. Uh, fucking. One thing I want to fucking do, because it's kind of funny. We're already talking about this. Uh, whoops. I don't want Let's go like this. Wait, what's this? So, your Polyev. Hill House. <laughs> they look so fucking similar, man. Just saying. Like, they look so similar. The only difference is the blue fucking hair. Like, <laughs> he's probably gonna fucking win. Like, Mill House is probably gonna fucking win the conservative shit, so. I, I, I just don't know what to tell you. But yeah, it's it it doesn't matter that fucking Patrick Brown's going. All the fucking right wing extremists love Pierre Polyev, so can't really say that I'm surprised. A conservative Party uh, member and organizer uh, named Debbie Jodoin. So she says she was working on the Brown campaign this spring, and she says that she had direct conversations with Patrick Brown about an arrangement that was going to see her paid by a private company, a third party, in order to do work uh, on the Patrick Brown campaign. She says Patrick Brown even connected her with that company uh, over a text message. Now that would uh, most likely be a violation of uh, federal uh, election laws, which say that registered political parties have- Bro, it doesn't fucking matter. Conservatives do this shit all the goddamn time. And, like, I'm sure it's more than just fucking Patrick Brown that's doing this shit. I'm sure fucking Millhouse is doing this, too. ...to pay for their own people to do campaigning uh, for candidates. She apparently uh, sort of felt uneasy, she says, about, uh, about this arrangement that was worked out. She went to the Conservative Party itself uh, with these allegations. And uh, just a few days later, Patrick Brown, out of the race. Now, so what's been the response? Like, from I'm honestly not surprised that he's out of the fucking race, to be honest. Like... He seemed to be like one of the f like uh lower fucking candidates when it comes to it outside of like the black chick, but like outside of that like uh, yeah, I don't know like a lot of people are fucking a lot of fucking dipshit hogs are supporting fucking uh, Millhouse, so it doesn't even fucking matter in the brown campaign. Well, Brown is still steadfastly denying that uh, that he's done anything wrong. His campaign is saying uh, again that the Conservative Party was never transparent; that they never offered any details uh, to the campaign about. What Bro, the Conservative Party is never transparent on anything. Are you really fucking surprised by that? Like, come on. What these allegations were, so that they never, uh, they say, had a chance to refute them. Now, the party itself is sort of pushing back against that. Just this morning, they sent a letter out. Uh, to Conservative Party members saying that Brown's account of that is wrong, that he was given a full uh, opportunity over several days to respond to these uh, these allegations, and that he never did so in a satisfactory way. They also... Well, when this shit comes up, like, honestly, this shit comes up all the goddamn time for Conservatives, so I'm not even surprised. Like, the one thing that's true about Conservatives is you're always going to have fucking allegations, whether it be, like, fucking, I don't know, minor... Doing shit with like minors or like fucking cheating in like or, or like rigging elections or like I don't know fucking cheating on their spouse with like a 16 year old or some shit. I it, it's just guaranteed if you're if you're a conservative politician, it's it's gonna be the fucking truth. You usually get you usually get one of those, sometimes two. 
who provided a little bit of insight into why they thought it was necessary to take this really extraordinary step of kicking him out of the race with just two months left to go. I want to show you this uh, quote from uh, the person running this uh, election, uh, this uh, leadership uh, race right now. It says the uh, LEOC, that's the Leadership Election Organizing Committee, could not afford the risk of having a leadership candidate under the investigation of Elections Canada for breaking federal law. Our leadership race is to select a person to contend for the role of Prime Minister of Canada. The process must be beyond reproach and in full compliance with the law. So clearly they're saying that, uh, you know, having this cloud of an investigation potentially under one of their top candidates for the leadership was just untenable uh, with, this, uh, with this race underway. So they took this decision uh, just a few days ago to, uh, to boot Patrick Brown from the race. He's appealing it, so he's trying to get back in, but the party, uh, as of their latest communication uh, this morning, seem to be still be uh, resisting. It doesn't matter that he's going to try and fucking repeal it. Nothing's going to fucking happen from it. So he's most likely going to stay out. Any sort of attempt by Patrick Brown to get back in the race, they're saying that he had the chance to respond to these allegations. He never did so, so he's out. So CBC's Nick Bois there in Ottawa. Um, but first, watch this. We'll watch this. There is smoke. another twist in the Patrick Brown saga. The whistleblower whose allegations got Brown kicked out of the conservative leadership race is speaking out. Longtime conservative organizer Jeb Debbie Jo Dwayne put out a statement where she says she was told she could be paid by a private company and volunteer with Brown's campaign, but that she soon started to worry the arrangement wasn't okay. This comes, she says, from conversations directly with Brown. She also says her expenses on the campaign were paid by a corporation. Now, Brown's campaign has said it believes she was just volunteering outside of work hours and did ultimately offer to pay back the company. Here to break this all down for us, Corey Tonight, former campaign director for Doug Ford and co-founder and CEO of Rubicon Strategy in Toronto. And uh, previously at the Calgary Stampede Grounds, I think we've got you home now, Enterprise Canada's Erica Verudi's former president of Alberta's United Conservative Party. Welcome to you both. Um, I will say, Corey, I want to start with you. I did actually just get a letter from the Brown campaign, the next step in this saga, but there's a lot of moving parts. Let's just start, Corey, with this whistleblower. Um, she's given her version of events, including talking about specific interactions that she had with Patrick Brown. What, what is our takeaway from this? What does this add to the story? Well, I think it, it adds a lot of clarity that was uh, missing 24 hours ago. We, we now know who, who the whistleblower was and, uh, and a lot more details about uh, what the transgression uh, was. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I think a lot, a lot of additional transparency, that's, I think, good for the party uh, overall. Uh, I, I, it, to my eyes, it's a very clear violation. Uh, this is something that uh, hasn't been allowed for many years in, in uh, Canadian politics. You can't. Bro, what are you talking about? Similar shit happens, happened with fucking Millhouse, and he's still in the race. Like, I don't know what the fuck he's talking about, man. Um, have a company make a donation or a donation in kind uh, to a political party. It's, that's, that, that's not news. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that that was ever a question in Debbie's, uh, uh, Debbie's mind because that's not a new rule. Uh, but it's clearly a violation. Like, I, 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 I see no, uh, no... Bro, then, like, literally every fucking party should not fucking exist in Canada. Because, like, every fucking major party accepts fucking donations from, or, or donations from fucking companies. So, it's mostly, it's, like, mostly from fucking lobbying efforts, so it doesn't fucking matter. No ambiguity around it. Well, Erica, so I want to talk to you a little bit about last night when this statement came out. We heard from the Brown campaign, they actually shared a letter that they had sent, um to the party last week in which they said listen there might be one incident um we really thought that this woman was just volunteering in her own free time uh but now we're realizing maybe that's where the concern is and in that case we'll pay back the money uh this kind of thing happens all the time um and now th there's a letter today in which they say 
uh, and I've just received this just as the show is going to air. This is from um, Patrick Brown's lawyer, Marie Heenan, saying, we have read Ms. Joe Dwayne's statement. It is our view there has been no breach of the Canada Elections Act, so they don't agree with you there, Corey, um, and that they want uh, to move forward on their appeal. They're expecting an answer, they say, um, by 12 p.m. Saturday, July 9th. This is a letter addressed to Ian Brody, who is, of course, the uh, chair of the Conservative Leadership Organizing Committee. Whole mouthful there, Erica. <laughs> but what I want to know from you is, I guess, do you buy it? Do you, what, do you, what do you think of their explanation? Yeah, I would say, well, I agree with Corey as well. Uh, so I do think it was in a breach, and I think it's a situation of a campaign trying to, you know, help their brand and the situation that they're in. You know, they speculated that this might be the whistleblower of the situation, and in fact, it was. And, you know, Debbie has now come out as a whistleblower, and that's very courageous, just given that, um, you know, that, that puts her in a position. But she, I think, did the right thing to come forward. And now we're in a place where, you know, they're kind of like grasping at straw to try and defend themselves and demand a, you know, by a certain time, where from my understanding uh, and from all of the documentation that's been shared by the party, there has been efforts to work alongside the campaign to resolve this. Um, and now, to me, it just seems like that they're trying to dig themselves out of a hole. I think it's pretty clear where you both stand, but Corey, I do want to ask you about one specific aspect of what the Brown campaign is saying about this, because y you understand how campaigns work, and this does sort of get into the backroom stuff that most of us don't see. Um, they said specifically in their comment to media last night, uh, as happens normally in campaigns which involve literally thousands of people working across the country, issues relating to volunteers, organizers, and lobbyists are raised directly with the campaign um, and an opportunity to address and remediate the concerns is given. So basically, like, this happens, normally we kind of fix it quietly. Is that accurate yeah. in your experience? I, I don't think that's accurate. Uh, I, I, and I'll, I'll go one step further. You know, what, uh, what the Brown campaign and what Patrick Brown said, you know, the other day on, your, on, on this show uh, was uh, that, uh, that this was coming from, uh, from Pierre Polio's campaign. Mm -hmm. Clearly, that was not truthful. Uh, this came from uh, an order. I'm sure like the seeds of it came from fucking Millhouse's campaign. Like, to be honest, because uh, I honestly think Brown was probably like. Brown was. Yeah, he is dog shit, but like. Like, all of them are fucking dog shit. And I think like Brown is probably like the closest one that would be able to possibly defeat. Uh, fucking Millhouse, but I don't think Millhouse is going to lose, to be honest with you. Organizer within his own campaign team who blew the whistle on it. So, like, I, I, I got to say, uh, when it comes to uh, to speaking truth, uh, Patrick Brown has not done himself any favors in his reaction to this. Uh, it, it, you know, threw a lot of dust and a, and a lot of smoke in the air around this, but clearly this is a violation. Like, uh, you know, you don't have to uh, have worked on a lot of campaigns uh, to understand that you can't give gifts in kind uh, through a corporation or a union or uh, any other uh, organization that's prohibited from making political donations. Like, that stuff used to happen once upon a time. It's been well understood for many years. It still happens, though, my guy. Like, what do you think fucking lobbyists are? They're just fucking corporation people, man. And you accept fucking money from, cor uh, fucking, from fucking lobbyists, so... I don't understand why you're fucking complaining about it. Here's now, but that's not allowed. Erica, they're clearly still pushing forward. The Brown campaign is uh, with this appeal, with this lawyer's letter. What, uh, what do you expect will come of that? Do you, I mean, the, the well, legal, I, okay, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, I mean, there is a legal process and, you know, Corey's talking about, it, you know, it's a breach. It's not just a breach on, you know, the rules of, of how you operate a campaign, but with Elections Canada. And my understanding is that's where it's now headed. Um, but, you know, they're going to push forward for an appeal that that happens when candidates usually get disqualified. It is unfortunate that this happened this late in the game um, and in the election cycle, because it does ultimately also hurt the party brand. Mm -hmm. So now the party needs to work on going through another due diligence process. Uh, process to make sure and doing their due diligence to make sure that the appeal is is deemed fair um, if they are the the body then which decides that and you know and then the brown campaign is going to use every resource including the legal action that they've started to use um, to, to try and position themselves as not being uh, guilty of, of what's being put forward
Yeah, Corey, you sort of alluded to this earlier, that, that it was more transparency, and there'd been a lot of pressure on the party, or certainly some pressure, to be more transparent about them. It'd been one of the key criticisms in all of this. I, I wonder if you think the party's reputation has taken a bit of a hit in this process, even though, obviously, you are... No, I honestly think fucking Millhouse is doing an excellent job on making the fucking Conservative Party take a hit. He literally fucking walked with that loser that walked all the way from fucking Vancouver. To, he, he literally fucking walked with side by side with him who was going, or who was fucking marching to fucking Ottawa. Even though, you know, he was known to be dis, or demoted to private and then dishonorably discharged. I think Millhouse is doing a, a perfect job when it comes to that front. Um, not so credulous of Patrick Brown's explanation in all this. Yeah, well, like, look, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm surprised he didn't put out more information uh, right off the hop. Now that we know what it is, I think there's a lot more clarity. Uh, I, I certainly understand uh, much better now what, why the decision that, uh, uh, that the organizing committee uh, for the leadership race uh, took. Like, I, I think it's, it's, it's a clear violation. And uh, I think the stories uh, and, the, and, and the spin that's being put on this by, uh, by the Brown team is uh, it's just not credible. Okay. Erica, last thought from you just about the race uh, going forward. What do you think uh, is the most important thing to watch, I guess, moving forward from this? Yeah, I do think, you know, the party needs to pivot and focus now on the race, rise above from this, allow the due process to happen, but really focus on, you know, the, 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 the candidates that are still in the race to, to not be focused on that and focused on what their vision for Canada is um, and how they're going to. Of course they'll fucking focus on this. This is perfect. Like, they got rid of a fucking opponent. Millhouse is going to be very fucking happy about this to position our party to be successful uh, going forward. And and I think that's, you know, going to be, this will be a couple days. It'll still loom. I'm assuming that the Brown campaign tactics will continue for, you know, another week or so. But I, I think from a party membership standpoint, people are ready to move on and focus on the actual actual race and hear about candidates not getting into the weeds of another campaign, but what they're going to do uh, for the country and for the party. Okay, we're going to leave the conversation there. Thank you both so much for your insights, Corey, tonight. The already contentious conservative leadership race just got way more contentious. Patrick Brown is disqualified from running to lead the Tories. The party says his campaign broke campaign finance rules by allowing a corporation to pay for work done on the campaign's behalf. Tonight, Patrick Brown is here to respond to that serious allegation. Oh, this is going to be fucking awesome. I'm really glad they have him on here. I can't fucking wait. Look at this. Look at this thumb, man. Look at it. He's even got the fucking city of Brampton in the background flag, or the fucking flag for the city in the background. That's fucking awesome. Then party president Rob Batherson will react live. And longtime conservative strategist Corey Tanike and the RIT.ca's Eric Grenier are standing by. They'll be listening in and break the back and forth. We have another thumb, fellas. It's, it's great down for us all. Let's start, though, with Patrick Brown, disqualified leadership candidate. Hi, Mr. Brown. Good to see you. Thanks for making the time. My pleasure. Mr. Brown, did a corporation pay somebody to do work on behalf of your campaign, and did you know about it? He's either going to say yes, that he knew about it, or he's going to deny it. Let's see which one he plays. We have no knowledge of this. And oh, it was the second one. You know, all we've heard from the party was there is an anonymous allegation that someone was working on our campaign but being paid by a corporation. We had 1,800 volunteers in our campaign uh, around the country. And if there was anyone that was you know, working on our campaign during work hours, we would certainly um, have addressed it. But how do you respond to um, a phantom? And so let's call this what it was. Uh, the party establishment was nervous that Pierre Polyev wasn't going to win. Bro, you're literally the fucking establishment. And like Pierre Polyev is, he's not going to lose, especially not to the fucking likes of you. Like, there is no shot that Millhouse is going to lose the fucking, uh, he's, there's no way he's going to fucking lose. Like, let's be real. He's going to win. 
whether it be through nefarious means like like this shit or you know through like other other like regular fucking conservative means and his supporters Pierre Polyev supporters are the ones behind this disqualification uh, because they know we brought in 150,000 very motivated new conservatives from diverse communities that wanted to take Okay, but he also has the fucking PPC dipshits on his side, so what the fuck do you have? Like, that's Millhouse for you. Take the party in a different version, a different uh, path than, 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 than his version of extreme conservatism. Okay, let's parse out a, a couple of things that you said there. First of all, this idea that it's a phantom accusation. I've spoken to... Uh, members of the party who were involved in this decision, they say that they have the receipts, that, for example, this is not just based on verbal accusations. They also say that they communicated to your campaign these concerns first last week on Wednesday and then through a formal letter, which was required under the rules on Thursday, and that the, your <sighs> campaign actually responded Friday and you were given a number of days before the meeting that occurred last night to respond uh, in a more full way. Uh, your response to that? So they asked a number of bizarre questions about different um, cultural membership sellers. We responded to um, every um, question they had. And their final um, question was more recently on this issue, if there was someone being paid by a corporation. And we, we responded by saying, tell us the name of the person, tell us the name of the company, and we would research it because we had no idea what they were talking about. And so it's impossible to respond um, to um, an allegation with no details and you know, really it speaks to the fact that this was a very flimsy allegation um, put together by the Polyev campaign to disqualify an adversary they were very worried about and Vashi they were running TV ads um, recently the last few weeks in the Toronto area very ex a very expensive media market running TV ads against my campaign they were very clearly worried we felt I mean that's just fucking politics my guy like, are you really surprised by that? With the number that I signed up, the number that Jean Charest signed up, the number of new memberships that Dr. Leslie Lewis signed up, that Pierre's path to victory was very tenuous. And clearly, when they resort to actions like this, it speaks to the fact that they were worried. Okay, I do, I do, Mr. Brown, have to challenge you on the conclusive nature with which you're saying this is Pierre Polyev's doing. Do you have any proof that it is his campaign that brought this to the party's attention? Because both the party and his campaign say they didn't, that it was a third party. Do you have proof otherwise? So, um, uh, first of all, it was Pierre Polyev supporters um, on LIOC who are the ones um, uh, advocating for this. Uh, on top of that, um, members of Pierre's campaign um, had even communicated to my campaign chair, John Reynolds, that they were going to be successful in pursuing this. Um, and so very clearly, um, Pierre's campaign was behind this. Uh, and it's unfortunate because there's now over 150,000 members uh, who I signed up, many who joined the Conservative Party for the first time, who are now being disenfranchised, that they paid their $15 thinking they'd have a vote um, that where they could take the Conservative Party uh, on a different path. And, you know, the positions I took in this leadership... Bro, you would not take them on a different fucking path. You take them on the fucking path that, like, Aaron O'Toole did and fucking Andrew Shear. The reason why fucking Millhouse has so much support or, or has so much fucking support behind him is because he's different and new and, like, fucking fascist. So, of course, that's going to get the fucking... Dumbass PPC voters on his side. Like, he, at least he has fucking balls to go out with and walk with, like, fucking dumbasses who were, like, dishonorably discharged. What the fuck have you done, like, to be in the public sphere, my guy? Campaign were different than what some conservatives were accustomed to. I said very clearly, it doesn't matter who you love, where you're born, the color of your skin, what God you worship, we were going to fight for everyone. I said that I would attend <laughs> pride parades, I would I challenge can't. Islamophobia, you know, uh, I would oppose Bill 21 relentlessly. I took positions that the party hadn't taken before, and I think it made some uncomfortable. Uh, and I understand all of that, and certainly we've covered it extensively on this show. That's like the most fucking Aaron tool thing I've heard. Like, he sounds exactly like fucking O'Toole. Is this just O'Toole with, like, 
more hair and like a little bit younger like it has to be right show but again circling back to my original question you are very specifically saying that the leadership organizing committee of your party has been infiltrated dominated skewed by pierre polyev supporters and that pierre polyev's campaign is behind your disqualification you have yet to provide proof. You're saying a few people from his campaign called your campaign and, and said something to that effect. That is not proof. So, Vashi, it was a very heated um, discussion uh, last night at Leoc. It was a split decision. Um, and those who were pushing this were the ones who have had a history over the last number of months of advocating Pierre's uh, positions on, on, on Leoc. Uh, and it, this is unheard of. The fact that you have a, a leading contender for a national political um, national political party leadership disqualified mere days before the ballots were sent out um, is is wrong. It's an a, egregious abuse of our uh, democracy, um, and we know very clearly um, who was behind it, who benefits from this. Uh, the one person who benefits from this is Pierre Polyev. Vashi, it's his supporters who are the ones, the people that have advocated. Uh, um, for every request he's had before, from an earlier leadership vote to not having me approved as a candidate, the people that are his biggest advocates were the ones pushing for. Like, don't get me wrong, fucking Millhouse sucks ass, but like, it's it honestly just seems like he's making up excuses for all this shit. Like, they have there's fucking receipts released and everything. You're just mad that you got kicked out because you thought you could be the fucking. Uh, dumbass Simpsons cartoon character. This, um, and he's the one celebrating today. But I would go further, Vashi. The person who should really be celebrating is Justin Trudeau. Because if Justin Trudeau gets to face a Conservative Party led by Pierre Polyev, who wants to ban childhood vaccines for polio and smallpox, uh, or run on monetary Bro. policy um, that you can opt out of inflation. Bro, you guys would, you would fucking do that too, you dumbass. Like, what? Like, we saw the fucking hogs, like, dying because they didn't get fucking vaccinated. Like, I honestly don't know what the fuck to say, man. ...through cryptocurrency or associate with individuals like Pat King, uh, Justin Trudeau is going to... And, like, it, it honestly doesn't even fucking matter who, like, the next leader for the Conservative Party is because they're going to lose to my sexy librarian. Like, he's so fucking sexy, like, there's no way he's gonna lose to you. Or, or just any fucking conservatives. Because, like, we watch the conservative leadership debates, both the French and English. Like, they were funny as fuck. And all the candidates are just dog shit. So, you're, you're, even if you were to, like, be the leader, you'd just be, you're just another fucking Aaron O'Toole. That's all you are, except, like, the only difference between you and Errol Tool is, like, you have a, a head of hair, and uh, you're a little bit fucking younger. ...have the easiest election of his lifetime, and that's why, that's why I think the person who really gets to celebrate today is Justin Trudeau. Look, again, I, I, I feel like a lot of that we have covered extensively, but the allegation that's being, you know, made here very specifically, the idea that your party breached campaign finance rules, are you sure, or your campaign rather, breached those rules, are you sure your campaign didn't? Yeah, we, we have no knowledge of, of this allegation. Um, listen, we had 1,800 volunteers working um, around the country. Um, and we told the party, we had no idea who this anonymous allegation was. And if anyone was working on our campaign during work hours on behalf of a company, we would immediately address that. And we've been very clear that we want every rule to be followed with uh, the Canadian Elections Act, with the party's election rules. Um, but really, we were put in a position that we had to respond to a phantom allegation with no names, no details. And that's impossible to do. I want to ask you more but but like debbie already came out though my guy like it, you fucking lost it, it's game over for you fucking aaron o'toole jr broadly about the the nature of the allegation okay i take your point that, that you don't have specifics on it the party contends differently i'm reading right now a statement from 
uh, five counselors, uh, a majority group of Brampton counselors, they're saying, initiated forensic investigations into allegations of financial irregularities, nepotism, and possible backroom contract irregularities under uh, uh, Patrick Bounds, uh, they're saying, failed leadership. Uh, they're, they're pointing to a number of things that they want to investigate about you. I'm, I'm looking at, I'm thinking about Canadians who are watching the progression of your campaign, who are listening to all this, who hear you say, it's not me, it's not, it's them. It's not me, it's them, over and over again. Uh, and I wonder- I mean, he's literally just doing the fucking conservative thing though. It's not, it's not me, it's someone else. Like, I fucked up, it's not my fault. It's, it's their fault. Like, that's just the way of conservatives though. That's how they work if they can be totally convinced given the questions about uh, that these counselors are raising including you know a couple deputy mayors uh, given the fact that the conservative party took this yes extraordinary step but did take the step and contends they have more than verbal accusations can you understand who can how Canadians watching tonight would have some questions about the ethics of the campaigns you run so um, first of all, I should say, I, I don't think it's a big surprise that uh, there are um, two different blocks on city councils. I think in most cities there is um, uh, different uh, uh, positions and councillors that, that, that have different perspectives. In this case, uh, there is um, five councillors who have taken one position over the last number of years and five councillors who have taken another uh, position. Um, the block of five councillors um, that uh, you spoke about um, they uh, made uh, allegations. It was investigated by Deloitte. I supported the investigation, and Deloitte found there was no wrongdoings at all. These were allegations against our previous um, CEO, and I'm glad that it was investigated. I'm glad that uh, um, the the complaints were were dismissed. Um, but you know, their involvement right now is clearly at the behest of Pierre Polyev's campaign, who have been trying to create uh, disruption. Um, in Brampton, just like they're doing right now th through running very expensive TV ads every day in the greater Toronto area um, uh, media market. I guess what I, what I wonder... He, he's so mad that he's losing the fucking mill house. I mean, to be fair, I would be a little bit mad if I lost the fucking mill house too. Like, fuck, I should, we should just call Nelson and just bully the hell out of him. <laughs> is, can you understand how saying this is all Pierre Polyev's fault, this is all his doing, might fall a little bit flat when you do see the other parties who are concerned about your leadership and the ethics of that leadership. In politics, there's going to be um, two sides. And whether it's a municipal election, a provincial election, a federal election, you know, there's going to be um, different uh, perspectives and they will be fiercely um, uh, fought uh, campaigns. Um, but at the end of the day, what happened last night was wrong. Um, to disqualify a leading contender for the leadership um, a mere days before uh, ballots are being sent out has never happened um, uh, before. Uh, it's disenfranchised 150,000 Canadians and it's done on an anonymous complaint. And so, you know, no matter how Pierre's campaign. Again, Debbie had came forward stating that, you know, a fucking company paid you without you know fucking lobbying or the party establishment s spins this what happened was wrong but are you really contending this final question are you really contending the party that you wanted to leave is completely corrupt like do you see what a serious allegation that is and do you really believe it <laughs> i mean of course they're fucking corrupt bro even liberals are corrupt and i have my problems with fuck the fucking ndp too but like, uh, the conservatives are probably like the most fucking corrupt. Like, yeah, Justin Trudeau fucking sucks, but you know, at least he's sexy. That's something you have. He has. I believe that Pierre's campaign successfully um, lobbied enough members of Leoc to get what they wanted, and they wanted. Uh, they didn't want an election. They wanted a coronation. And this is not new behavior for the tactics of the Polyev campaign. They have bullied MPs. My campaign co-chair, uh, Michelle Rempel, got threatened to be thrown out of caucus for um, calling out 
um, uh, Pierre's campaign for their association with the convoy. Um, Ed Fast, one of the leading members of uh, Jean Chéret's campaign, uh, got booted as finance critic um, uh, by the Polyev supporters in caucus. Um, he is using his majority in caucus to bully. So this is not a new tactic, and unfortunately, he was successful last night. And I say unfortunate because the Conservative Party membership deserves to have um, an election. Let the members decide. It shouldn't be a few people late at night robbing members of, of, of their democratic right. Unless they really believe, unless that party really believes that you have broken the law. Well, clearly it was a split decision last night on Leoc, and um, you know it was very clearly um, the agenda of uh, the Polyev supporters. And if they have any allegations, uh, any name, I I'd love to see it. Uh, but right now, all we're dealing with is a phantom allegation, and you know I would have no tolerance for anyone that uh, um, breached um, the law. If there's anyone that uh, wasn't abiding by campaign uh, finance laws, I would immediately. Um, uh, demand that, it, that, that it's addressed. But all we're dealing with right now is an anomalous complaint um, with no name um, and no information. Okay, Mr. Brown, I have to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Man, he was just going in circles the entire fucking time. It's Pierre Polyev's fault. Who the fuck is the whistleblower? It's Pierre Polyev's fault. They're bullying me. Mommy, send help. My pleasure. That was Patrick Brown. Rob Batherson is the president of the Conservative Party. He's been listening in from Halifax and joins us now. Hi, Mr. Batherson. Good to see you. Thanks for making the time. Hi, Vashi. I'll pick up where Mr. Brown left off. Did uh, Leoc, did the party provide the substance of these allegations, including names, including dates, to Mr. Brown and his campaign? Well, first, Vashi, it's a sad day. You know, we're a dedicated group of uh, volunteer conservatives on the leadership election organizing committee mm. from coast to coast to coast. Nobody joins LEOC to disqualify a leadership candidate. But we had serious, serious information, serious allegations, allegations that dealt with violating the Canada Elections Act. And Mr. Brown's campaign was provided ample opportunity uh, to respond. Uh, they provided a written response. Um, and the response was wanting. And uh, over the last several days leading up to uh, last night's uh, Leadership Election Organizing Committee meeting, uh, our committee chair, our legal counsel, attempted uh, sen with senior members of Mr. Brown's campaign, with Mr. Brown's legal counsel, to find a path where that campaign could come into compliance. And unfortunately, that 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 uh, couldn't, uh, that didn't take place. Uh, that's a question that really Mr. Brown and his campaign team will have to answer. What we're trying to do is do the right thing, regardless of the candidate, and we apply the same rules equally to all six right. candidates. But, but that's why we, what is we this had to refer audio? the information to Elections Canada so that they can initiate uh, their powers to investigate and determine yeah. uh, what actually happened. I do understand that, but respectfully, the, the question was whether or not Mr. Brown was afforded due process. I take your point that a letter was sent, a letter was received. I put that to Mr. Brown, but what he is contending is that the nature of the allegations, the specifics that could have I enabled him to act on them were not provided to him. Can you say unequivocally that those specifics were? What I can say is Mr. Brown was given a great degree of information. Mr. Brown was afforded an opportunity to uh, meet with the chair of the Leadership Election Organizing Committee, with the party's legal counsel. He declined. Uh, again, th these are questions that Mr. Brown will, will have to answer, keeping in mind that we also have to afford due process when, when, some, when a whistleblower comes forward with information. They have certain rights that uh, we have to follow. And now, ultimately, it's going to be up to Elections Canada to... Uh, to He's not going to get reinstated in, into the thing. Like, he's he's already out and everything, so... Don't know. ...investigate. Uh, there's a lot of material, Vashi, a lot of material, and uh, we're going to... We're handing that over to Elections Canada, and they will take it uh, from, from this point. And, and that complaint or that uh, information, the whistleblower that you're speaking of, you heard very clearly Mr. Brown allege that it is 
uh, so, uh, someone associated or within the Polyev campaign. Can you tell us more information about who brought this information to your party's attention? There's no evidence that uh, any of the individuals that, that brought forward information are affiliated with uh, any leadership campaign besides Mr. Brown's own campaign. And again, that's why we're handing it over now to Elections Canada, so that they can make a determination as to what should be done vis-a-vis -vis the Canada Elections Act. And we had a decision to make at, at LEOC. Uh, do we refer all these troubling allegations to Elections Canada and leave that cloud hanging over uh, Mr. Brown? Or did we make the, the difficult yet necessary decision to disqualify a candidate? And, and again, you know, n nobody, nobody enters this thinking, uh, you know, we, we want to do this, but we afforded Mr. Brown, we gave Mr. Brown's campaign uh, the better part of a week to attempt to get their affairs in order. And unfortunately, their response fell short. I, I mean, to, to be fair, though, uh, and I take all that into account, I'm thinking about, in the same way I told Mr. Brown, you know, Canadians watching tonight, you gave him a better part of a week. You sent him a letter Thursday. His campaign responded Friday. He basically had the weekend. I mean, was there not some sort of middle ground? Did it have to go straight to disqualification? We're at a pretty late stage of this race. There are only six candidates. Like, this is a big deal. You have disqualified someone from running to be the leader of your party at this stage in the game. Uh, like, was there any wiggle room there? It just seems so drastic. Unfortunately, when you're faced with trying to do the right thing, the, the notion of trying to sweep this away, cover it up, pretend that it's not serious. I do think that they do have it out for him a little bit. Because, like, if this shit was to come up with, like, the current guy in, in, the, in the lead for the... to become the fucking candidate, like, say, fucking Millhouse, if this shit was to happen to, happen to Millhouse, they wouldn't give a shit. Because he's in the lead. The only reason why it's a big problem for Brown is because, like, he's, like, the main opposition. So, I do think that they have it out a little bit for him. Because, like, it doesn't fucking matter. I'm sure that the rest of them have shit like this as well. But either, like, nobody cares because they're too small. Or... Or they just, or they just like watching The Simpsons. Yes, when it is very serious, the Canada Elections Act and ensuring that our candidates follow the law is extremely serious. And ultimately, Leoc felt that the responsible thing to do was refer the evidence and the information to Elections Canada, and based on the unsatisfactory responses of Mr. Brown's campaign, to make the very difficult decision of disqualifying. Nobody, nobody wanted to, to be there, and I think there was a lot of good faith effort on, the, on behalf of the Leadership Election Organizing Committee through our chair, Ian Brody, to find a better path than, than being forced to, uh, to be. All fucking conservatives do is just repeat the same fucking goddamn talking points. Look, he's like, oh no, it was fucking, it's, out of our control, it's Election Canada's problem now. He violated the fucking... Th he violated the terms. You know... Pierre Polyev did fucking nothing. It's all the fucking same shit. It's, it feels like I'm honestly watching this on repeat. Like, it's just looping and looping and looping. Service, man disqualified and mr brown's campaign was well aware that that this option was uh, going forward they were aware of the meeting last night uh, nobody should be caught off guard that that's uh, that's uh, that was the option was, was it a split decision so, sorry for interrupting i apologize i'm just running out of time was it a split decision last night as mr brown referenced well it was it was a more decisive decision than mr brown's own margin of victory when he won the ontario pc party leadership um, so it wasn't unanimous, uh, but was, what was unanimous is every LEOC member felt these allegations were serious enough to be referred 
to uh, Elections Canada for investigation. So, so were there two um, sort of votes or two sorts of decisions taken? I just want to be clear for, for our viewers. When you say it wasn't unanimous, was it, as, be, as has been reported by other outlets, 11 to 6 in favor of disqualifying Mr. Brown? And then was there a separate vote on whether or not to send the matter to Elections Canada? There was one vote on disqualification, and in the discussion around that vote, and again, uh, you know, I listened to Mr. Brown's interview. Uh, I understand he's hurt. I like Mr. Brown. I've known him for over 20 years. I'd have a beer or a coffee with him, uh, depending on uh, who's up to the table. But we have to set aside personal opinions to make the right decision. And last night's uh, uh, debate and discussion on this was very respectful, wasn't heated. Uh, people were respectful. In really? He seems pretty fucking heated about it. I'm just saying... Like, I honestly don't think that he's not fucking heated about it. Like, or it wasn't a fucking heated argument. Of course it was fucking heated. You know that shit's heated. In terms of disagreements as to whether these serious allegations <sighs> warranted uh, disqualification. And then we had a vote, and there was a clear vote to disqualify Mr. Brown. But even those that didn't vote in favor of disqualification... Uh, they all said they wanted this investigated by Elections Canada, and they all recognized that these were serious, serious allegations of violating federal law. I just have a few seconds left, but doesn't that split vote underscore a little bit of what Patrick Brown is saying? That this, that the fact that it wasn't unanimous is that it maybe wasn't the right decision to make at that time, at this point in time in the leadership? No, because we're faced with serious allegations of breaking the law serious allegations of not following our own rules as a part okay but like conservatives do that all the goddamn time like uh, there's been so many fucking allegations against like conservative politicians all the time and nothing fucking happens to them and like this is the only fucking time when you're actually you know taking action like it seems kind of sus to me Party. To brush that aside, and I do want to respectfully challenge, you know, Mr. Brown's national campaign co-chair, Michelle Rempel garner uh, she brought forward uh, an email in May uh, about a party member uh, who engaged in horrible, racist uh, commentary. And Bro, that's like every fucking conservative, though. Every fucking conservative is, like, racist and, like, fucking homophobic, transphobic, like... Is that really surprising? Like, that's just how conservatives are. They're just more bigoted liberals. And and declared himself a supporter of Mr. Polyev. Our party acted immediately on that. So we deal with allegations regardless of the source, regardless of who they are targeting, and we prosecute those those allegations seriously and fairly. And I have a message for those who join the campaign in support of Mr. Brown. You have a home and a place in this party. I know you must be hurting uh, with your candidate having been disqualified because of the, the serious allegations, but stay involved, cast a vote. The Conservative Party has a home for you. Okay, I have to leave it there. Mr. Bathison, thanks very much for making the time this evening. Thanks, Vashi. Hi, I'm Vashi Capel. All right. Uh, Banks of Canada are... Hiking interest rates to, I think, 4.4%. Well, the number is in. No, 2.5%. So that just means that things are going to get even more expensive, like uh, a fucking down uh, payment on your house, for example. The Bank of Canada just announced its interest rate decision. Why don't I send... <laughs> Why is she talking like that? Is she a fucking robot? <laughs> The Bank of Canada has made its decision on what the interest rate is. That over to you, CBC Business reporter Scott Peterson watching closely. I'm getting that sense. Scott, what is it? It is a whopper. I've never seen this before and I'd have to check the records, but it's up 100 basis points. That means the overnight uh, interest rate by the Bank of Canada is up, up, up to 2.5%. That's beyond the 75 basis point that we were expecting. Uh, and the 75 point rise would be the highest going back to 1998. So that predates that. So this is really a red flag now by the Bank of Canada. Bro, I think both of them are robots. I, I think that they're both trying to figure out like how to communicate with humans.
say that they are very serious about rising inflation in the country and a hundred basis point rise by the Bank of Canada overnight. Now the backdrop here is that we're at 40 year high inflation rate, 7.7 percent is Canada's inflation rate and that's the highest it's been going back all the way to 1983 and that's significant because that back then we saw mortgage rates nearing 20 percent and so the Bank of Canada clearly taking this uh, as an indication that it has to move aggressively against that inflation rate so a big surprise a hundred basis point rise 2.5 percent our new overnight interest rate Suhanna and I should mention as well that's the rate that the banks borrow at so that's uh, increased automatically and that will hit variable rates immediately and eventually a lot of other rates as well fixed mortgage rates line of credit uh, car loans etc so a big announcement from the Bank of Canada just such a fucking heavy breather man like every time he inhales I hear it and it's so distracting just this moment and I know we're watching for a news conference. That's set for about 11 a Eastern, so in an hour. We'll get the why behind this 1% hike yeah. what will you be listening for Scott uh, certainly there's gonna be a lot of questions for Tiff Macklin the Bank of Canada governor as far as is he moving fast enough is be is he behind the curve and more importantly and most importantly how high does he think this rate is going to go is it going to be three percent he's indicated it could go over three percent three and a half percent a lot of economists think by the year end so that's all important particularly for people that are already stretched with their mortgages watching very closely the language as far as how high he thinks the rates gonna go so so a big surprise Prize already from the Bank of Canada. We will talk again. Thank you, Scott. Sounds good. For reaction, our chase team has reached Kevin Page in Ottawa. He is a former parliamentary budget officer, also president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. Kevin, you've been on the program before. Always great to have you back on. Tell me, mm. 100 basis points, one full percent. Did that shock you? Yeah, it's a shocker. It's um, I think a lot of people in the market, Suhanna, were thinking 75 basis points. Uh, even at 75 basis points, that would have been a big increment. We've seen previous increments at 50. Watch as conservatives try and like blame fucking Trudeau for this. It, it you know it's gonna happen. Like uh, he is partially responsible, but. They're gonna do everything that they can to be like, look, he's cause he's fucking increasing fucking prices just to, you know, fucking warm his hands or whatever the fuck he what's whatever the fuck he does with my fifty basis points. So actually oh, you know, to go to a, a full percentage point, it's a bit of a shocker. But you know, there were people thinking out there, there are people thinking in the United States we might see something similar, another a full hundred basis point increase in, in their policy rate as well. We're talking about inflation being one of the things that ca that's causing this full percentage hike. In Canada, apparently the Bank of, Can uh, Bank of Canada expects it to remain about 8%. We're getting the overnight inflation in the U.S. at 9%. So does that uh, calm the fears of rising inflation, the bank being so aggressive? Yeah, the bank is, is definitely being aggressive. I think even at 2.5%, um, at that's the policy rate today, uh, it's still, you know, considered to be, you know, relatively accommodative or low relative to what a, a trend would be. It would, you know, even if we had inflation in the one to three percent range, the bank would be comfortable of having a policy rate of about three percent. So we're still, it's still an accommodative interest rate, but it's a very big increase from where um, when we were having these conversations earlier in the year. Uh, yeah, it's an aggressive, it's a much aggressive stance with respect to the, you know, you know how they're they're looking at inflation right now. People who bought houses when the interest rates were, you know, like one and a quarter percent, perhaps even less in some cases, they are, what do you think they're doing right now? Yeah, I think the housing market is the, probably really the area that we need to be most concerned about. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about a soft landing in this environment for the economy. We were fucking concerned about it even beforehand because of how fucking expensive housing is in this goddamn country. Like, fuck. Millennials are s only, like, now starting to buy houses because of fucking COVID, you know, reducing the prices of housing. And now that things are going back up, it doesn't fucking matter. And then, like... Uh, oh. And then, like... Gen Z doesn't know what the fuck to do because, you know, they're just 
they're just gonna wait for the fucking world to burn or, or the fucking country to burn crush and burn raising interest rates trying to cool the economy try to you know you know change the arc on these rising inflation rates but yeah right now for for mortgage uh for people that have bought a, that bought a house over the past couple of years uh, their big concern is to see month-to-month -month declines in housing prices uh, these increases in in mortgage rates, you know, of 100 basis points, it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars per month for people that are carrying a mortgage of, of five hundred thousand dollars. So uh, it's it's definitely the uh, the big concern. I think the bank probably got it wrong with respect to in 2021 when we started to see these big increases in inflation rates. I think now we need to be a little bit concerned that the bank, you know, needs to be worried about the risk in the in terms of the housing market because we don't want to really you know, trick a bubble that's that potentially could be there in the housing in the housing market. One of the things we all the bubble's gonna pop either way. They're expecting it to pop like fucking June 2023. And then a lot of people are gonna be fucking homeless because of it. Unless, you know, fucking universal housing is implemented always have been watching here on uh, here at CBC News Network is uh, China's economy. I mean, they're fighting uh, outbreaks of COVID-19. We've been looking at the war in uh, Ukraine, uh, oil prices being high and also being volatile. How does all of that fit into global economic growth and where Canada stands with its growth? Yeah, so, I mean, I think expectations for global growth um, are, are certainly coming down for this year and for next year uh, because of COVID in, in, in China. I think because of energy-related supply issues in Europe, uh, just in this massive amount of uncertainty, and we see central banks attacking inflation really across the world. So this is going to, you know, this is going to slow growth in Canada. The, those uh, economic projections that underpin budget 2022 were far too optimistic, uh, and yeah. So I think we're, you know, people are, finance ministers, central bankers were adjusting to uh, a slower growth environment, and you started to see some. Flattening in terms of uh, commodity, global commodity prices, because mm -hmm. now people are factoring in the possibility of a recession. And, and let's talk about that. I mean, last week. And like, uh, I honestly think a recession is coming. Like, it, it's going to happen. Mostly due from like the fucking conservatives under Harper, you know, of how fucking dog shit he was. When it came to that kind of stuff, as well as fucking Trudeau, you know, not actually doing anything from fucking or like fucking COVID and like actually supporting the fucking working class. Like, it's gonna happen. Kevin, economists with RBC predicted Canada is headed towards a moderate uh, recession. What do you make of that projection? Yeah, I think, again, we, we can't, you know, it, this isn't, you know, an assumption of where we might be. I mean, it's clear that um, when we get the announcement, as we did today from the government of the Bank of Canada, that they're attacking inflation. They're raising interest rates dramatically. As, as Scott alluded to, we haven't seen this kind of upward, you know, increase in interest rates in modern history. So, again, it's almost a, it's an, almost a plan-induced kind of slowdown in the economy. Again, we, we hope that it can be soft so that we won't see you know, significant declines in output, significant increases in employment, uh, which would be, I think, difficult for all countries and, and, and certainly our political leaders. And finally, Kevin, you know, we've been talking doom and gloom, as you say, people who have variable rate mortgages, they're probably just wondering, what the heck am I going to do now? Um, people who have lines of credit, who have debt, who, who benefits now? Who, who, where is the upside? Who benefits now? Uh, the capital owners, whether it be fucking... Uh, landlords or fucking business owners or I don't know like fucking anyone who owns something that can make them fuck tons of money that's who benefits from it I think the upside, like Suhan, is that you can't actually see, and if you one combs the data, you don't actually see signs of a recession anywhere. You see a strong labor market. You see, uh, and we look the at business. The labor market is dog shit because everyone just keeps fucking quitting their jobs because they're getting underpaid with uh, sometimes pretty fucking awful benefits. 
So they keep fucking moving or, or leaving, going to work somewhere else because they're trying to, you know, get by the, by the skin of their teeth. And the labor market is young and it's diverse. Like, a, a lot of them are just taking up fucking jobs that, you know, they don't want to do because they have to pay off the fucking student loan debt that they have. Or, like, just just something that can, can maybe get them by with, like, a couple roommates. Outlooks type of surveys, uh, we, they see future sales growth dampening somewhat, but still still st strong growth. Uh, yes, in, in businesses intending to invest. So, the re, you know, honestly, like, the, the recession is something that's it's really, uh, you know, could be many, many months, many quarters kind of down the road. So, again, as long as the labor market stays strong, we could find a way to pay these sorts of bills. We can avoid kind of this. But, like, the labor market isn't strong. It's very fucking weak right now. Like... People want to work, they just don't want to do the shitty work uh, that their fucking bosses are wanting them to do, and they don't want to fucking work for shitty ass wages. Sort of, you know, month to month or quarter to quarter declines in output increases in employment. So, again, there is some positive that we're still seeing on a relatively strong economy. And when we look at household saving rates, business saving rates, they're pretty strong. All right, there is some uh, light at the end of the tunnel, then, and it isn't a train rushing. There, there is no fucking light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to enter into a recession. This guy's just a fucking moron. Towards us. Kevin, always great to have you on the program. You be well, okay? Good to be with you, Suhanna. Kevin Page is a former parliamentary budget officer. He's also president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. Okay. Well, that's that. So, yeah, it's, it's that. We're going to have a lot of fun watching all that shit. Thanks for everyone for stopping by. I'm going to probably go have something to eat and maybe go to bed. Because I just kind of, like, fucking lost it, like, after a certain amount of time so yep we will be back tomorrow playing xenoblade 2 or more xenoblade 2 so look forward to that hopefully we can get further in the game maybe we can be at, done it before july 29th till then see you later